organizations and institutions schemed um, to run the clock out on the ability of victims to secure some measures of justice. I say that at the outset. We certainly have learned numerous cases through painful personal testimony, testimony that individuals have given to members of the committee. We've learned uh, the staggering scope of abuse from documents such as the grand jury reports. Today, we will also hear more testimony from individuals here in person. At this time, I want to note that we do have uh, individuals in the audience, several legislators who've been at the forefront of advocacy on this issue. Uh, certainly, their energy and passion have elevated the cause of achieving justice on behalf of victims, and uh, we want to thank them for their continuing contributions to this deliberation. At the outset, I would ask everyone to please silence your phones with this proceeding. As with so many uh, issues, we encounter competing perspectives, and you will hear those deeply held and diverse viewpoints today. Uh, today's testimony, I expect, will be very emotional, um, but I would ask that we keep in mind that it should also be very respectful. This is a serious inquiry from the Senate Judiciary Committee. This is not intended to be a, a rally. Um, for the proceedings to have decorum, we ask that everyone show each other civility and respect. The committee will continue to hold open the ability for individuals or organizations to submit testimony via senatorbaker.com or through the Victim Advocates website. Jennifer Storm has provided that opportunity for victims as well. Um, the hearings are being videotaped. They will be available on the Senate website as well as my website. And um, I just want to thank everyone for your attendance and the members for their participation. At this time, I'd like to give Senator Farnese, the ranking Democrat minority chair of the committee, a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for holding and scheduling hearings on this very uh, difficult an emotional topic. As we know, Pennsylvania has convened several grand juries to investigate the institutionalized sexual abuse of children and subsequent cover-ups. We were one of the first states to address uh, this abuse, and yet, after revelation after revelation of insidious, systematic, and chronic abuse of children, this body has yet to take action. Every day, victims of sexual assault are forced to live in the shadow of their abuse. Every day, they face triggers and grapple with the consequences. Every day, these victims spend years afraid of intimacy, afraid of relationships, and some even take their own lives after becoming exhausted with the struggle. I'm eager to hear today's panelists and their perspectives on how we can assist these victims and work to ensure the end of sexual abuse and exploitation. Again, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your support your advocacy, uh, thank those members, those elected officials who have been on the forefront of these issues. Look forward to hearing their testimony as well today. And again, thank you, Madam Chair, for, for holding these hearings. Thank you, Senator Farnese. Um, I am Senator Lisa Baker from the 20th District, which includes Luzerne, Wyoming, Susquehanna, Wayne, and Pike counties. Um, I would like to begin to the far right with Senator John Gordner. I'd like to ask each member of the panel to introduce themselves and share where their senatorial districts are located. Thank Senator you, John Senator. Gordner, 27 senatorial district, all of Columbia, Montour, Northumberland, and Snyder counties, and part of Luzerne County. Wayne Langerholtz, Cambria, Bedford, Clearfield counties. Senator Gene Yaw, the 23rd Senatorial District, which is all of Union County, all of Lycoming County, all of Sullivan County, all of Bradford County, and the western half of Susquehanna County. Uh, Senator Scott Martin, I represent the 13th Senatorial District, which is the southern half of Lancaster County. Good morning, Senator Joe Pittman, representing the 41st District, which includes all of Armstrong and Indiana County, as well as a portion of Butler and Westmoreland County. Senator Art Haywood, 4th District, Montgomery County, Philadelphia County. Senator Maria Collette, 12th District, parts of Montgomery and Bucks Counties. 
Senator John Sabatina, representing the 5th District, which is Northeast Philadelphia and the River Wards. And I'm Steve Sanicero, and I represent the 10th District, which is in Bucks County. Thank you to all in, in attendance. Senator Carney is also here in the audience. Um, Representative Brazi, I believe, is here. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being here. Our first panel will begin with Marcy Hamilton Esquire, the CEO and Academic Director of Child USA, Robert A. Fox Leadership Program Professor of Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Attorney Hamilton, thank you for being with us. If you will pull the microphone close enough to you and push the green button so everyone <laughs> may hear you. Um, in the interest of time, I know you submitted your, your remarks. Um, we generally hope that testifiers don't repeat everything that you've submitted, but if you could share those high key points so that there's ample time for questions from members of the committee. Thank you so much. You may begin. Thank you so much, Senator Baker and the committee for inviting me to test today, testify today on this incredibly important issue. Uh, I'm Marcy Hamilton. I'm a professor at Penn and CEO of Child USA. I've been a Bucks County resident for 35 years, uh, and uh, I'm married to a cradle to grave Catholic who still goes to church. I'm here today to discuss legislation that is in the public interest. You're going to hear from victims later today, but I want to focus on what the public gets from SOL reform, statute of limitations reform, and in particular, revising, uh, revi reviving the expired civil statutes of limitations, or as we call them, windows. We now have enough experience with Windows. I'm the leading expert on the country on these issues. My organization, Child USA, tracks them. And what happens with window legislation is that the truth comes out. And how does the truth come out? By empowering the victim to be in court and to be able to get discovery. Without a window, because of Pennsylvania's increasingly antiquated statutes of limitations, what happens is that the victims are silenced, but they're not just silenced. They don't have any weapons. None of the defendants who will be sued when a window passes in this state, which it will, none of these victims have the capacity to get their institutions, and their perpetrators to share with them the truth, unless they're in court. How do we know this? We've seen this happen in other states where it has been uh, perfectly constitutional. Windows identify your hidden child predators. As the state of Pennsylvania since 2005, when uh, I was part of the grand jury investigation and wrote the recommendation for remedies in the 2005 grand jury report on the Philadelphia Archdiocese, one of the things that we asked for was statute of limitations reform. This body responded by adding a mere 20 years to the criminal SOL. They did absolutely nothing on the civil SOL. So this has been 14 years. Now, for the survivors in the room that are, uh, might be in despair, it took us 16 years in New York. It took 14 years in New Jersey. And California has just passed the second window after 16 years. Hawaii has passed a third window for an extra two years, for a total of six years. So what happens? We identify the hidden predators. We shift the cost of the abuse from the victims who are bearing it now and the taxpayers who are paying, because the victims frequently can't support the cost of the abuse themselves, and we educate the public. And I'd like to highlight it's the educating the public. You simply don't know who the hidden predators are in your school districts. You don't know who the hidden predators are in many of your institutions. So the issue of constitutionality was raised. Uh, I was asked to speak to it. I'm happy to. I have litigated this issue across the United States. 
Uh, and the short answer is that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has never ruled on the constitutionality of reviving a civil statute of limitations. But we have enough case law that there is a very strong argument that it is constitutional. And anyone who tells you that it is clearly unconstitutional uh, is not being frank. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has not addressed this issue. But if it were to, I think it would follow all the other states that have had windows and also have remedies clauses. And in every one of those states, the window was held to be constitutional. Uh, I think it would be a lot like the federal ruling in Landgraf, which says that while in 1908, when Lewis was decided, which is the prime support for those who say it's unconstitutional, in 1908, the whole country thought it would be unconstitutional. You know why? Because judges did not defer to you. Judges did not defer to lawmakers in the early 20th century. That's what's changed. They now defer to lawmakers on procedural rules, on statutes of limitations. And that's why so many states have upheld this legislation uh, and the arguments are so strong in this case. I'd like to address, I, I was supplied Mr. Chopko's uh, testimony last night, late. I have not received Sam Marshall's testimony. I will submit supplemental response to Sam Marshall on the insurance issues. Suffice it to say on insurance, I'm speaking to some of the leading insurance leaders in the United States and fighting the victims is no longer the priority for most of them. That is not where they are right now. Uh, this is out of step to be, to be arguing against the victims today. With respect to Mr. Chopko, uh, here's the problem. Uh, this is all about truth. How do you get out the truth? The only way we ever get out the truth is through this legislation. Mr. Chopko suggests ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. People get paid, apologies get delivered, but it fails the truth test uh, because, as he himself says, what does ADR do? It means you don't have to focus on who was right and who was wrong. That's in his testimony. Mr. Feinberg and Ms. Biros are doing a valiant job of helping victims who can't wait for this legislature to act, who are suffering in this state, and I do not fault a single victim for going through the compensation program. God bless them. But again, the Feinberg Bureau's approach fails the truth test. No truth comes out as a result of these compensation programs because no discovery is permitted. And for the victims that have gone into the compensation program in New York and in this state, they have asked for files, they have asked for facts, and they get nothing. So, if the goal is to find out who the perpetrators are in this state and who are the institutions that are aiding and abetting them, we need a real window, not one that forces victims into three years of constitutional amendment, which may or may not happen. Let me just close by saying that no other state in the country has come up with a concept of telling the victims, sure, you can get justice if you get yourself a constitutional amendment. As someone who's dealing with every state in the country working on these issues, I think the constitutional amendment concept is cruel. How can you ask the victims to go back to lobbying for three more years to get a constitutional amendment just to go to court? And who does that benefit? It benefits the institutions and the perpetrators. It gives them three more years to hide assets and to do the wrong thing. So I would ask that you strongly consider fair SOL reform, and that after 14 years, I hope that the state can finally do what's in the best interest of your children uh, and not in the best interest of the insurance industry and of the bishops. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Um, in your testimony, you, you talked about the best science, the average age of disclosure, at, um, of a victim of child abuse being 52. Can, yes. can you um, 
elaborate on that? And, and should that be um, something that we take into consideration, uh, that particular age, based on the science and, and the information you have? So the age of 52 is from the most comprehensive study that's been done to date on uh, sex abuse victims. It was a study in which there were church victims and non-church victims. It's the largest number of victims ever studied. It was done in Germany, where they have many of the same problems that we have on these issues. And it was their scientific conclusion that the average age was 52. Um, it's the best science we have to date. We have other studies that show that a third of victims come forward as children, a third come forward as adults, and a third never come forward. Those studies are, though, a little muddier. Um, this, this is the most recent study, and it's also the most reliable. As you talk about seeking pathways to justice for, for the victims, um, as you know, a couple of years ago, we changed the statute about the definition of a predator. Um, it was actually my legislation that dropped the age from 18 to 14. Um, in, in the cases of the child victims who perhaps were um, victimized by a sibling, uh, 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 a neighbor, or, or the like, what should we be doing for a pathway to justice for those individuals who, for whom a window would very likely not not be an avenue for them to pursue? Well, for many of those victims, the window is an avenue. Many victims are capable of suing their family members for the sex abuse. And many of them will not come forward until their 40s or 50s because of the family pressure that's put on them. Many families with a, a resident abuser, whether it's the grandfather or the father or the uncle, often watch the statute of limitations. And once it cl they clear the statute of limitations, then the victim's allowed to say something. So uh, the window to justice has the capacity to help some of those victims. Not all of them, for sure. But we know with Which the window. Gets, with to, gets to my follow-up point yeah. that um, as we have this discussion, whether it is resources through our Crime Victims Compensation Fund or um, the ability for us to look at dedicated funding for adult survivors of child abuse through our victim service organizations. I, I, I'd like to open that conversation as well and, and would welcome your input on that. So the concept of a state fund that would displace the responsibility of the institutions and the families that are responsible for this is, in my view, misguided. The state should not be picking up what it is that the insurance companies insured and that the organizations caused. So to the extent that it would get in the way of accountability, because I guarantee you, no organization is going to change its child protective policies without litigation. They just don't. Uh, I understand that the Philadelphia Archdiocese is very proud of itself for saying it has the gold standard. Three toddlers came forward last year, three-year-olds, St. Francis Daycare Center, run by the Archdiocese. Their employee was sexually abusing three-year-old girls in the bathroom, and there was no rule against taking a child into the bathroom and closing the door. So the only way to bring these institutions to account, including families, is through litigation, because what most people don't realize is that the victims with the litigation get to ask for non-monetary changes as well as compensation. So when the Wilmington uh, Archdiocese settled with its victims as part of its 2007 to 2009 window, what happened is those victims refused to talk numbers until they had an agreement on improved policies. And those policies are required by the agreement that the victims uh, secured with the archdiocese to be on their website. So uh, a fund for those who need therapy and cannot get it is one thing. A fund that protects the insurance industry and the institutions that are responsible is irresponsible in my view. Thank you for your comments. Senator Farnese. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me um, sort of swing back to the, the legal, the constitutional 
question, because I, I noticed on page four of your materials, there's, um, um, I think, a, a, a point that you make, and I think it, it, it is a very good point as well, too, and I, and I think it, it talks about um, a, a distinction under Pennsylvania law the courts have made, specifically, I think, the Supreme Court, in, in the context, with, even in the context of sovereign immunity cases, and the difference between a retroactive application of a legislative procedural uh, enactment, such as a revival of an SOL, and the actual retrospective or retroactive application of a law. And, and in the law, those are, 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 there are distinctions there, and I think it's an important distinction. Can you elaborate a little bit on Because I do think it's a very, um, when I look at your explanation of, of the, uh, the land graph opinion, I, I think you're, you're on point there. So could you sort of just express a little bit that for me? Sure, Senator. So uh, the big question in these cases in every state to have challenges to window legislation is whether or not the change to the law is substantive or procedural. And what the courts have said again and again and again is that a procedural change can be retroactively applied with no violation of due process. But a substantive change cannot. And that is what explains the Lewis case. In the Lewis case, what was wrong and why it couldn't be applied retroactively is they were changing the substantive theory. They were changing what the employers needed to know at the time of the act. With statute of limitations changes, and we're very careful, it's just the date of filing. It's nothing else. And so with the statute of limitations change, it's literally just saying at the time that the sex abuse occurred, everyone knew it was illegal, and you weren't allowed to cover it up. That's what people knew. Um, and so they should have altered their behavior on the basis of the prevailing law. All that SOL reform does with a window is say, you had to go to court before you were ready at age 20 and then age 30 in this state, um, but now we're gonna let you go now. It's a change in the timing of the entry into the courthouse. It is nothing else. No other substantive change can be permitted, uh, and, uh, and no state has passed a window in which it was found that it was a substantive change. And, and, and I'll close with this, and I, uh, looking at, at the policy again, and if, if going back to U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and even in, in DICT as well, too, I, I remember, you know, the, the Pinto case, you know, where the courts, um, you know, not exactly the same issue, but piercing the corporate veil and allowing Ford to be sued based most entirely among the memos and the cover-up. So, I mean, the policy considerations, I think, are, are just as important sometimes as the black letter law, because the court is also interpreting what, what the policy would be as, and, and we see that cer certainly in United States uh, uh, jurisprudence. So thank you, thank you for my appreciation. Thank you, Senator Farnese. Senator Langerholk, followed by Senator Haywood. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you uh, for your testimony. I have a question. Uh, Two questions. One, first, the Conadaris case, which has been cited here in the materials uh, many times on, on, both, on both sides of the issue. And I want to just read a, a portion of that uh, case, which states, which deals with the remedies clause. I'm sure you're familiar with it. That the purpose of the remedies clause, the protection from legislative action of an individual's, individual's remedy for an injury done. Okay, you're well f familiar with that. To me, as I read that, it would seem to be pro-plaintiff. The remedies caused to protect for an injury done. Now, my question builds on that. As you testified that you have litigated this across, across the country, my question is, in, have you litigated that issue specifically? And what I'm curious to, what is the framing of the issue. What is the defense or those that are saying that this is unconstitutional? My question is, how are they getting over that? How are they framing their injury? Because it doesn't compute to me that a defense on that end would be what is within the ambit of the remedies clause. Do, do you follow me? Like, what is their defense? What is their vested right? I mean, clearly, I understand the issue on the vested right. What is their vested right that uh, is an injury, if so you follow me? The, the, the vested right of the defendants? 
how are they, how are in those other jurisdictions, how are they arguing or how are they framing that their vested right to right. a statute of limitations is, is something that the remedies right. clause, and assuming though also that the other remedies clauses of the other state constitutions is similar in, in, in yeah. statute to that? So, so the other states have uniformly rejected the concept that there is a vested right in an expired statute of limitations. So there is no vested right for the defense in avoiding going to court. Now, if there were a change in the substantive law, so all of a sudden you would be holding that defendant culpable for something that they weren't culpable for at the time of the event, in that circumstance, that's a vested right. You have a vested right in the fact that you're not liable for what happened at the time if it wasn't illegal. So um, the vested rights doctrine is a dying doctrine, frankly, across the United States. It has been since the end of the 19th century. Uh, but what's clear is increasingly there is no vested right in simply the deadline of going to court. Thank you. Uh, if this legislature, to me, as I read this, as I read through all these cases, as I look at all of this, I see I think it would make more sense that a violation of the remedies clause would be say if this legislature would say we are going to take away your right to sue till you're age 25. Right. Would you agree that that would make no more question. sense within the remedies clause, right. not a prospective defendant going forward? Right. I mean, the remedies clause was intended and equity is intended to protect someone who has been wronged. Uh, and the fact that a statute of limitations has expired is not a wrong under the law, and that's both true under the federal and the Pennsylvania constitutions. And at the time that this was in place, it was a, uh, I don't want to get into crime with ex post facto, but it was a violation of, of a, a civil nature. So we're not, we're not adding that no, through. No, that's right. And one further uh, question. There, the, there will be testimony, I believe, after you uh, – citing the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment through deprivation of personal property. Can you, has that, that's the first time I've seen that. Has that yeah. been an issue that has, has come up? No. Can you speak to that? Uh, the takings clause has not been an issue, and the primary reason is that once the Supreme Court came down with the Kelo decision, it's virtually impossible to succeed in any kind of takings clause case without the government taking everything from you. So, you know, there was a lot of pushback in Kelo because there was such a taking of, of uh, this woman's property rights, but they didn't take everything. So uh, it doesn't fit. Uh, I've noticed the takings clause suddenly floating in the last couple of weeks uh, in the state of Pennsylvania on these issues. It's not happening in any other state. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Langerholk. Senator Haywood, followed by Senator Santacero. Uh, thank you. Thank you for seeing me. You were here uh, when we had the hearings with Senator Greenlee, so good to see you again. <laughs> thank you. Glad you're available. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, following up with uh, Senator Langerhold's questions, would, are there any significant differences between the Pennsylvania Constitution and the constitutions of the other states where you said you've had some victories on, this, on the window question? No. no. Second question. Um, I just checked with uh, uh, Sarah. She let me know that on the criminal side, there's only one crime where there's no statute of limitations currently in Pennsylvania, and that is murder. Could you tell us why in this situation these, uh, this conduct should get the same treatment as murder in terms of elimination of the statute of limitations on the criminal side? So uh, in terms of the, on the criminal side, first, you know, the state of Pennsylvania is one of the few states left that hasn't eliminated the criminal statute of limitations completely. And so then the question is, is why have 44 states already moved toward the concept that murder has no statute of limitations? The, the problem with child sex abuse is that the victim is so disproportionately unpowerful compared to the perpetrator. And this is true up to age 17. They simply don't have the capacity to understand it, resist it, put it into place. The, the kind of context they need to understand it. And so for the vast majority of these victims, that's why the average age is 52, 
right, that people come forward. And a lot of people come forward later. They wait until their parents pass away because they don't want to hurt their parents. So for the vast majority of victims, uh, being sexually abused as a child is not at all like breaking your leg. You break your leg, you go to mom, you go to the hospital, you get a cast. This is secret, you don't understand it, and you don't get the help you need. So what the uh, elimination for the 44 states in D.C. that have completely eliminated the criminal statute of limitations, what that's all about is this incapacity for the victim to come forward, and that's what happens with murder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Haywood. Senator Santacero, followed by Senator Yaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Professor. Thank you for being here today. And I was actually going to ask uh, two questions that uh, Senator Langerholtz and Senator Haywood just asked. First, about uh, the takings argument, which I think is completely inapposite in this case. And secondly, about the other state uh, constitutions. Um, so I, all I will say is I completely agree with you. It is time that we give these victims uh, their day in court. Um, it's shameful that that hasn't happened till now. We don't need to amend our Constitution to make that happen. Um, and um, moreover, I think this idea of some kind of fund is a completely cynical attempt to subvert justice in this case. So again, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Yaw. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just so I uh, understand, what you're talking about is strictly a civil statute of limitations. And uh, I, I think that throughout this whole process for years, and I know talking to people, uh, there's a lot of confusion between a civil statute and a criminal statute. And, and, and I give you credit for explaining that it's unconstitutional to revive a, 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 a criminal statute. Right. Uh, you can't go back and make something a crime that was, you know, that's passed. Uh, one of the things that, that I, and I think to some extent that maybe the confusion has been uh, fostered a little bit, uh, and it's not critical, but it's just the, the, not a criticism, but it's just the fact that the Attorney General has been involved in this and has taken a stand, and the Attorney General is viewed by most of us as a uh, law enforcement. So I think that that confusion has mm -hmm. run rampant through this, and I, I really appreciate what you said in your uh, testimony, uh, and that is, uh, in a civil case, and just so that everybody understands right up front, a civil case is a lawsuit, and the plaintiff, as you said, the plaintiff still bears the initial burden of proof, and if the plaintiff does not have corroborating evidence, the case is over. The defendant need not defend cases where the plaintiff lacks evidence and simply need file a motion to dismiss. Right. And, and I think that that's important, I, and I'm not saying it People shouldn't file, but people also need to understand, you've tried cases, I've tried cases. I know Senator Langerholt and Senator Gordner have tried cases. You know, lawsuits can go on for a long time. <clears throat> I don't know what the time is in Philadelphia. Uh, you, you know, we're talking about years. Yep. And so it's not, and I don't think that we need, we should foster or promote any, uh, uh, any belief that Oh, if we change this, all of a sudden things are going to happen overnight. It's not going to. It's going to take a, a long time. And I appreciate your testimony that talks about those practicalities, I guess, of what's going on. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, seven windows are opening this year. And so what Child USA has done is create a survivor's kit for each of those states because we are deeply concerned about the trauma of going into the legal system, right? And you already have injured individuals. This is really hard, but it's the best process we've got. So, um, and it doesn't happen overnight. That's a fact. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, we've been there, done that. The, the legal system, it can be traumatic. Uh, there's no question about it. To be grilled and maybe that, that you know, it's one of the things that we learn, I guess, uh, sitting here, you know, you get beat up by the other side and you, be quiet because eventually it will be your turn uh, and that's the, the the organizational structure that we have which uh, I guess it creates order out of chaos so. right right uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Yaw. Senator Pittman, followed by Senator Gordner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, and thank you for your testimony. At one point in your verbal comments, I believe I heard you use the term school districts. Yes. Were you referring to public schools? Yes. Okay. So in, in your belief, whatever we may do, um, it should be equally applicable to public and private institutions? Absolutely. So the, the, the New York Child Victims Act, which just went into effect in August, includes uh, not only uh, the public schools, but it also got rid of the notice of claim requirement, which made it very hard for victims to ever get to court. Uh, the New Jersey bill that was just passed, that window, which opens December 1st, applies to schools. Uh, the Delaware window applied to schools. Uh, it seems to me it's only fair. Uh, we have problems in the public schools. Uh, they've been mandated reporters longer, so maybe not as many, but we can't even study it um, because it's been hidden. And so that would include institutions of higher education as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. At all public yes. institutions, yes. okay. Uh, you, you also mentioned that our state Supreme Court has never heard a case as it relates to this, but that you believe case law justifies the change without a constitutional amendment. In your professional judgment, how long would it take for litigation to work through the process of, for the state Supreme Court to hear a case and make a ruling? Well, in these cases, um, it's not uncommon for those issues to get expedited, and so the constitutional issue gets taken out as the one thing that you're going to litigate, and it can go up through an expedited process, two to three years, possibly. Um, but uh, the vast majority of these cases settle because of the fact that uh, there are no false claims. And so once the defendant is actually in statute, um, they basically sit down, they are forced to share the truth, uh, and then they settle. So, um, so it's a much faster process than one might think. Okay, but did I hear you say if, if they don't settle, it's two to three years of... Possibly. ...of legal dispute? Okay. In, in one case, that's not necessarily upholding all the other uh, cases and negotiations that are going on. So in the state of New York, the day before the window opened, Rockefeller University settled with 200 of the victims of uh, Dr. Archibald, uh, who looks like he abused about 1,500 kids uh, as part of his pediatric practice. Uh, that it was because of the legislation that they settled, uh, but they never did go to court. Okay. And of the other states you've referred to, have, have they all focused entirely on um, child abuse minors, or have any uh, also uh, made changes as it relates to adults? So it's interesting. This has been quite the year for statute of limitations reform. We've never seen anything quite like it. We're starting to see innovations. One of the innovations is New Jersey. Their window applies to both child and adult victims of sex assault. Uh, and uh, Vermont is another change in which they have simply eliminated the statute of limitations in the civil cases completely. There's, it's not a window that opens and closes in Vermont. It's permanent. There will be no statute of limitations defense in civil claims. So we're seeing an increasing push for even more capacious windows as time goes on. And, you know, the, the logic of it just gets stronger and stronger. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Pittman and Senator Gordner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman, sorry. Uh, in Virginia, I understand that the legislature there uh, passed a window, that it was litigated, and that the courts in Virginia, uh, looking at their constitution uh, and a remedies clause that was similar to ours, threw that out, and that Virginia is now pursuing um, the constitutional amendment process. Can you shed light in regard to what the status is in Virginia? Uh, to my knowledge, Virginia has not had a window uh, in, that, in fact, um, to my knowledge, there's never even been a bill that's actually a revival of expired civil statutes of limitations. Uh, they did extend their statutes of limitations. 
Uh, now, maybe it happened in the context of another issue. Um, so Agent Orange has been a subject of this kind of legislation, asbestos. I mean, there have been a lot of issues that come up later in life, but I'd have to go back and look at Virginia, what Virginia case you're talking about, but they haven't had a window. Okay, you're not familiar with the, the, the process and that they're going through in regard to a constitutional amendment for the remedies clause. I do understand that they're going through a constitutional amendment for the remedies clause, but they had not, um, they, they have not seriously considered a window. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Senator Gordner. Um, one final question, and just um, want your uh, thoughts or opinions about the Rice case mm -hmm. and how you believe that will impact uh, what is, what could or should or um, isn't being done. So the Rice case is a big change in Pennsylvania law, uh, essentially saying that fraudulent concealment claims can go forward uh, as a question for the jury. Uh, rather than a judge question. And so in the past, when there's been an argument under fraudulent concealment, in other words, the argument would be that the bishops covered up that these priests were abusing children, um, and this victim never knew, and so they didn't go to court because they didn't have this information. Uh, all those cases have been rejected in the past. Uh, the Rice case accepts the theory, says that fraudulent concealment is a live theory, but it radically changes the power of the victim because now it's a question for the jury. So judges were routinely throwing out fraudulent concealment claims. Now the judges will not be permitted to so long as Rice is in the picture. Now, you know, fraudulent concealment requires uh, a record and concealment uh, and getting to court in a certain amount of time. And so it's tricky. It's not going to apply to a whole lot of cases. Um, but uh, it will help a small number of victims. Now, it's still not decided by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, so we don't know if it's permanent anyway. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, you indicated you'd like to submit additional information as, as the other testimony development develops. You're welcome to do that, and we Thanks. will share it with the members of the committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our second panel um, includes Stephen L. Makochik, Esquire, who is Professor Emeritus of Constitutional Law at Temple Law School, and he's also a visiting pr professor of jurisprudence at Ave Maria Law School. And while Attorney Makochik is, is um, taking his seat at the table, I'll note the presence of Senator Muth, who has joined us as um, someone in the audience. Thank you. You want to say? Thank you. Senator Baker, thank you very much. You know, I'm a teacher and I'm used to answering questions. And when I was listening to uh, Professor Hamilton's testimony, I heard an awful lot of very interesting and intriguing questions from, from the committee. So I'd like to spend the bulk of my time trying to respond as best I can to those questions. I do want to make a couple of points in response to uh, Professor Hamilton's testimony. Uh, let me bring you back three years ago, and if you remember, uh, the Attorney, Gen Attorney General Kane at that time had to come in to apologize essentially for taking the position that revival legislation was consistent with the Pennsylvania Constitution. And uh, Solicitor General Castor gave what I thought was a very good uh, brief to the committee concerning how revival legislation would be inconsistent with the remedies clause. Uh, I don't know if the present Attorney General has issued uh, a specific legal opinion. If he has, I'd be more than willing to uh, take the time to respond to it in supplemental testimony. Um, but it isn't, um, it isn't that people are not being frank about the constitutional arguments. It's that they're very difficult arguments, and uh, 
they have to be responded to. Um, Professor Hamilton argues that the Lewis opinion is antiquated. It said, among other things, not only that vested defenses were protected by the remedies clause, but that will also include statute of limitations defenses. It was decided in 1908. Of course, uh, what wasn't mentioned is that Canitherus in, that was decided in 1908, Canitherus in 2008 reaffirmed that language. So it's not of antiquarian value uh, at all. Um, I think in terms of the written testimony that Professor Hamilton submitted, it's very intriguing. It, it's, uh, Attorney, it, it really is. Some folks are having difficulty hearing you the mu now that you have the okay. microphone a little closer. Thank you. It's very instructive, but it's very um, short on Pennsylvania law. Uh, the main case that she cites is the Bible case in 1997. And um, it's not a remedies clause case. It isn't even mentioned in the opinion. It wasn't raised by the parties. Uh, it's a due process case, and that involves very different issues. You're not talking about the due course of law, where you're trying to protect the litigation rights of plaintiffs and defendants. You're talking about uh, governmental action um, to deprive somebody of life, liberty, or property. Uh, it's a different perspective. And even if it were the same, what the Bible Court reaffirms, and this was decided by the Supreme Court in 90, 1946 in Agustin, is that whatever you do in terms of reme remedial change, you can't destroy the underlying claim, you can't destroy the underlying defense. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you had a case where the statute of limitations was five years. Um, the legislature amends the statute of limitation that makes it one year. So long as the litigant still had the right to bring the case, so long as that one year hadn't lapsed, there was no destruction of the claim. All right? Here we have something different. We're talking about the, cle the complete elimination of vested uh, statute of limitations defense. Um, I think that's all I would say right now in specific response to Professor Hamilton. But what I'd like to do is spend the time trying to answer some of the, I think, very intriguing legal issues that were raised by the committee. So if uh, there's any questions I can answer, if you want to renew the questions that you asked to Professor Hamilton, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Sen Senator Yaw, did you want to pursue that? No? Members? Senator Hayward? Uh, thank you, Professor. Now, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Baker. Now, uh, S Professor, our role here, you know, is in the legislature, and we don't sit here as the Supreme Court or any other level of court in the Commonwealth. And since we don't sit as the Supreme Court in the Commonwealth, uh, do you think it's proper for us to hear the arguments on both sides and then make a judgment um, to take a risk that we agree with one legal opinion or we agree with another one? Since in the end, we're not the ones who are going to decide what the Supreme Court will do, but we can decide what we will do. Well, I, I'm not here to tell you your business. I mean, you know it far better than I do. But you take an oath when you take office to uphold both the Pennsylvania and the federal constitution. That means you have an obligation when you pass legislation to make an independent judgment concerning its constitutionality. And based on the testimony I submitted, one, I think the, uh, the two-year window, particularly, well, it's in both 540 and 962. The two-year window is inconsistent with Article 1, Section 11, the Remedies Clause, 
and I think we discussed that fairly extensively three years ago in the memorandum that I submitted, we've recirculated. And I also think it would be inconsistent with the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. I realize that seems like a strange argument. You know, you're going to sit back and say, well, the takings clause, that's eminent domain. It deals with real estate. Historically, the origins of the clause was in preserving personal property. It was the confiscation of personal property by uh, the revolutionary armies that triggered it. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that it covers not only real estate and not only personal property, but intangibles. And the Supreme Court gives the states a great deal of deference in defining what is property that's protected by the takings clause. To be exact, in the land graph case, Justice Stevens actually says when we're talking about the Fifth Amendment, it protects vested property rights. All right? And you have a vested property right all right, to the statute of limitations under the takings clause as discussed in the Lewis case in 1908 and reaffirmed in Canitherus. Now, you can sit back and say, well, we're out of step with a lot of the country. That may be true. Uh, a lot of the country, I think, has similar constitutional language, uh, but it hasn't been interpreted the way we have. I think the other, the other two states who have any similar interpretations are Utah and, and Missouri. Do we have the right to do that? Yes, we do. Was it a good thing to do? I don't know. You asked me for a legal advice. You didn't ask me for public policy advice. Should you change it in the future? That's up to you. Can you retroactively change it? No. And if you do it, you're going to run into federal constitutional problems. That isn't to say that you should turn the back on people whose claims for abuse have lapsed. It simply means you're not going to be able to address it through litigation. You're going to have to find another way. Senator Haywood has a follow-up, and Thank then you. we'll go to Senator Pittman. So I understand that you're a professor of constitutional law. Uh, what would you share with us in terms of your record or prediction of what the Supreme Court will do? Oh, I was pretty good on the, uh, the Maryland Cross case. To be exact, I nailed it. Uh, I not only predicted what the cut would be, but I also predicted the Lido would write the opinion. And I'm not just saying that without uh, substantiation. Uh, there was a radio interview I did that you can access online. Senator Haywood, Thank I, you. I, I, Thank I'm you. not sure any of us are good at predicting the Supreme Court, but uh, <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> at, at least in that case, I was. In that case. Thank you. I, um, before Senator Pittman, I just, just want to make it clear in, in one question. Do you believe the remedies clause applies to both the plaintiff and the defense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Thank, yeah, thank you. Sure. Senator Pittman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Professor, thank you. Sure. I, I had asked the uh, Professor Hamilton, and I'll ask you this same question. In your professional judgment, and what we've seen here is a pretty stark uh, varying opinion, professional opinion between the two of you. That's not surprising for attorneys. Well, and that, that leads to my question because ultimately whatever we do, absent a constitutional amendment, I'm convinced we'll uh, go before our Supreme Court. How long do you believe that would take in your I don't, professional I don't, I don't know. She I, estimated. I, I, I defer to, to Professor Hamilton's uh, prediction on that. Okay, so her, her prediction of two to three years is. is I, I just simply would... don't know. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. Um, our, our constitutional amendment process, as outlined, would, would require us to pass an amendment in this session and then require us to pass an amendment again in 2021 which would likely put it on the ballot in November of 2021 for the voters to decide, making it mm -hmm. a, a two-year process, and at the end of that, establishing certainty. If, if we were to pass a constitutional amendment, would that eliminate the professional disagreement that we've heard this morning? No, because we still have a federal constitutional issue. 
Okay. So you, you believe no matter what happens here that we may well then, after either the Constitution is amended here in Pennsylvania or the state Supreme Court makes a final ruling that we will then find ourselves in federal court? No. Um, see, a little bit hinges on the remedies clause issue. I mean, if the Supreme Court affirms Rice, I don't think that raises any federal constitutional issues. It's just an interpretation of, of the remedies clause. Um, you know, the, 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 the hook is this, that under the remedies clause, Pennsylvania creates a vested property right in statute of limitations. They have a right to do that. That's part of the federalist system. Was it a good idea? I don't know. But they have a, certainly a right to do that. Once they've created the vested right, certain things apply under the federal constitution. One is you can't take it, and of course you're taking it if you're completely eliminating it, for public use, the old public use cases used to say they have to, you know, the public has to be involved in some way, and here you've, you know, you're taking the, the rights of some litigants and you're annihilating them for the rights of other litigants. But those cases are, are old, and I think Professor Hamilton's right, it's Kilo. Uh, that's the, the governing law in terms of what the public use is. Is there a public use here in eliminating the statute of limitations vested property right? The answer is, of course there is. There's a compelling interest to remedy this harm. It's a horrible thing. You know, but then you've got the odd situation of, okay, if it's private property, and the state gets to define what private property is for the most part, if it's a taking and you have a complete elimination of the private property when you say we're going to revive uh, stale claims, if it's for public use, then you have to give compensation. And nobody wants to do that in terms of defendants. So you've got the Hobson's choice under the Fifth Amendment. Either you can't do it because you know, it's not a taking, which it is, or it's not a public use, period. Or if you can take it because there is a public use, you've got to pay compensation. We don't want to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Senator Langerholt. Good morning. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. You submitted uh, testimony, I don't know if you testified or not, in 2016, uh, this, before this committee. I was not a member of the Senate at that time when the last hearings were held. Uh, at that time, you, your testimony or your s written testimony uh, dealt with the Remedies Clause. Today, That's right. you are supplementing that and adding the Takings Clause. But back in 2016, you didn't raise this issue of the Takings Clause. Is that correct? Oh, you, no, it, it, because the, the issue, there wasn't a question of a constitutional amendment to the Commonwealth Constitution. There was no reason to do it. Okay. So that's based solely on the, yeah, the I developments mean, the issue, for a constitutional, but that is not with respect to the Remedies Clause or anything dealing with a retroactive window? No, is no, that no, what you're no, saying? no. But back in 2016, there was a statutory attempt to um, revive uh, expired claims. It was just statutory. There wasn't a... <clears throat> constitutional amendment proposed to the, uh, the Commonwealth Constitution. So our um, focus was exclusively on whether the statute would be inconsistent with Article I, uh, Section 11 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. Now, maybe I misunderstood what I was being asked to do by this committee, but I thought this committee was inviting me to uh, uh, discuss the constitutionality of House Bill 963 which Section 1 would make a constitutional amendment to the Remedies Clause. And I thought the committee was asking me to say whether I thought if that happened, whether it would raise any subsequent problems. I, the testimony I submitted uh, last, well, this week, Monday, was yes, I think it would. It raised problems under the Taking Clause. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, the, the Remedies Clause and the Lewis case sure. from, from 1908, uh, isn't it true that the Lewis case doesn't specifically reference a remedies clause anywhere in that case? No, no. By no, name? No, no. Not, no, no. I'm saying by name. There's nowhere in that case it specifically says remedies clause. It says due course correct? of law. But not remedies clause. Well, but due course of law, you know, it's like saying, you know, law of the land is the due process of law. Due course but of law. But in the cases that come after that, and specifically the case that I no, referenced but, prior. But I'm, that, sorry, that, I'm sorry, you, that you, you're mischaracterizing that. Yes, it doesn't actually say remedies clause. It gives the 
synonym for that, which is due course of law. That's not due process. It's a specific uh, term. I don't mean to be nasty. I'm sorry. But it's a specific term that it's a term of art that is synonymous with the remedies clause. In the cases that come after that, specifically the Conadaris case yeah. uh, that our Supreme Court has said, and, and I'll, I'll quote that language that I quoted to the previous testifier, that the remedies clause, the protection, it's, it's, it deals with delinquent taxpayers, I understand the issue, but the delinquent taxpayers lose sight of the purpose of the remedies clause, the protection from legislative action of an individual's remedy for an injury done. And then further within that case, there's a footnote or, or a headnote that the language of the remedies clause protects every man's ability to recover for tort or contract injuries. Now, no, you're familiar a, with that case? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, it, but I'm, you're, I'm getting, you're, I'm getting you're, to my you're, question, you're, though. Okay, Just go on. bear with me. So my question is, as I read that, that it would be pro-plaintiff. It would be the remedies clause to design to protect individuals if their remedy is taken away. So... The question that I had to the previous testifier, what is the injury done oh, 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 I see. to, what is the injury done that is, sure. that sure. is a violation, in your opinion, uh, of the remedies clause? Because I can't, I can't get there. Okay. I mean, firstly, please forgive me. Um, if you go through Canitherus, they actually quote approvingly, the language in Lewis, which says not only claims but defenses are protected by the remedies clause, and that includes the statute of limitation defenses. The point, if I understand you, that you're raising is, okay, what is the statute of limitations protecting? What's the what's the you know the underlying concern that uh, we're trying to address? with the remedies clause as it relates not only to defenses, but more specifically statutes of limitations. Justice Breyer in strong, S-T-O-G-N-E-R, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very bad at pronouncing names, strong, that deals with a retroactive criminal statute, admittedly. But the, the underlying concerns are the same when you're talking about retroactive applications of a revival of claims. He says, look, there is a reliance interest that on defendants the part that's being destroyed. Let's say that you have somebody who, um, uh, you know, there's allegations against the person of uh, childhood sexual abuse. No claim yet, but there's some allegations. All right, let's assume for the sake of argument he's innocent. We can't kind of just sit back on statistics and say the statistics say that, you know, most predators are guilty or most people accuse the predators by children are guilty. You know, it's like trial, trial by Twitter. I mean, we have a legal system that presumes innocence. All right, we have a legal system that says in civil litigation the burden of proof is on the plaintiff, okay? Well, let's say we have this person and there's allegations and the person is innocent. Well, the person may have, say, airplane receipts or dinner receipts to show that he wasn't around. He wasn't where the allegations of sexual abuse occurred. Or he has them in his file cabinet or his drawer, etc. And then the statute of limitation expires. He throws them away. I don't need them anymore. Right. Well, that person has now relied on the statute of limitations to his detriment. Right. So that is one of the considerations. And it's true, it's applicable not only if we're talking about criminal revivals, but also civil revivals. And again, if you want to see the discussion, take a look. I, we, I think in my 19... Uh, 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 a 2016 memo, I think Professor Hamilton's 2016 memo, uh, she and I both give you the citation to the case. It's a, I think it's a 2003 Supreme Court opinion by Justice Breyer. By the way, in dictum, Breyer actually revives this notion of vested interest under the Due Process Clause. 
I mean, Professor Hamilton says, well, it's antiquarian. Right? But they actually revise it. It is dictum. But he says, look, you know, what we're doing, what the dissent in this case is suggesting, all right, would give uh, the holders of uh, vested property rights less, more protection than criminal defendants. And he cites to the Chase case in 1942, which in footnote eight talks about a vested right, all right, could defeat uh, uh, due pro process um, uh, 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 revocation of defenses. Can I answer anything uh, else? Uh, no, but Sir Langer, that, that's true. Sure. Uh, I disagree with you, okay. uh, and I sure. think that they, as I read it, it is to protect an individual's remedy and to use that to somehow skew or pull a statute of limitations defense I don't think is the intent of the, of the remedies clause. I, I, That's my it, I, don't, I don't know what the intent of our remedies clause is. All I know is the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court's interpretation. And with all due respect, Senator, that you're quite wrong. I, I believe that that means you're going to agree to disagree on that yep, point. Yep, I, I and, will agree to disagree. Sure. And um, I, Senator Thank Farnese you. has a, a sure. request, Professor, um, before we conclude your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Professor. Um, just in listening to your um, your testimony and, and your written materials, um, I and, couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Your your written materials and oh, your sure. and your and your testimony, Danny. Thank you again, Professor. Just if you could follow up with the chair on a response to this, with regard and specifically that I believe it was the Lewis case as well talked about the vested right with respect to an exemption or defense. It says it, it can exist, and I think you actually said as well, even in the statute of limitations. That's what it but, says. But, but the rest of that sentence, Professor says, when the bar has attached. So it says that a vested right with respect to an exemption or defense can exist, even in the statute of limitations. There's no period there. Oh. It says, when the bar has attached. Sure, so I guess sure. my, my question to you would be if you could follow up with the chair, and I understand what time, and I won't, but. Professor, if you could follow up with that in writing to well, me. Well, the and question, I'll, if I could yeah. just ask, ask the question. And the question would be, Professor, um, is it that what you're trying to say, and I don't think this is, that a defendant, a potential defendant, would have some kind of reliance interest knowing that if they committed an inappropriate act or a, 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 a or act, a crime, whatever it might be, in the civil context, not a crime, they can then rely on the fact that that statute of limitations is there in order to, and the, uh, and, 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 for, yeah. in, in or, before they even commit the crime or before they even no. commit the offense? But you, you're, I mean, the, the presupposition that you're making. And I can understand when it attaches. I understand that. They've, okay. they've committed a okay. bad act. And, but now you're saying that they actually have an interest even before they commit the act? Let me, let me, let me. When we're, attaching that, what I would, if you could follow up with that. We're, we're, all right, I'll follow up on sure. Thank, Th you. thank you, Professor. Greatly appreciate it. We have several panelists who um, have flights to catch later on, so we want to try to keep on time. But if you could please share that, I will pass it on to you. all the members. Thank you so much for your participation. Our panel number three includes Mark. Chopko Esquire, who is the chair of the nonprofit and religious organization section at Stradley, Ronan, Stevens, and Young. Brian D. Wenger, who is uh, a corporate advisor, attorney Wenger, um, and attorney Elizabeth A. Benjamin, who is a partner in the Beard Legal Group. Attorney Chapko, if you would like to begin, we're, um, as you've heard, we've asked people to summarize your testimony that you've already provided. You've heard much of the dialogue, um, so we would welcome your input, and we'll ask each of the panelists to give remarks, and then we'll open it to questions. Okay, thank you, thank you thank very you. much, and thank you for allowing me to be part of the conversation here with the committee um, as you review the implications of revival or window legislation 
Um, my uh, uh, remarks are directed to the impacts on the wider nonprofit community. Um, I understand your focus to be how to facilitate healing and recovery from childhood sexual assaults and the role of legislation in that process. Um, as noted in my, final, in my filed testimony, I am one of the staff writers of the Dallas Charter for the Protection of Children that led to rigorous reform inside the Catholic Church's own processes. Uh, I note that even in the grand jury report from last summer, only two incidents of the thousand reported were, uh, were incidents that occurred in the last 10 years. Um, and these were incidents that were reported to church authorities and then to civil authorities as is required in the charter. And even in my um, cursory uh, review of, of pieces of the grand jury report, everything that was reported to church authorities after 2002 was reported immediately to civil authorities. So that the focus here is really on what about those cases and incidents that happened before that. And the particular focus of my testimony is whether litigation is the right answer. As reflected in my testimony, um, you know that, that I think that this is not the best solution for the healing of victims, and I think that it has substantial adverse consequences for the nonprofit and charitable community. Um, let me just say a word about each of those two points. My experience in dealing with victims uh, of abuse and misconduct over the 35 years that I've been doing this work is that they want to be heard, they want to be acknowledged, they want to be apologized to, they want to be healed. They want to know that what happened to them will never, ever, ever happen to anybody else. Um, to the extent that money and compensation fits into this, it's just something to help people get their lives back on track. Um, and, and frankly, in civil litigation, a, a verdict is a way of signifying that we're holding the wrongdoer or the institution accountable. It's a very public way of, of doing that. It's not the only way of doing that, but it's a very public way of doing that. I think um, based on my own experience and has been already commented here that the process of litigation is difficult, expensive, time consuming, and it's with apologies to Professor Hamilton, not really about finding the truth. It's about establishing winners and losers. Um, the idea of, of, uh, of, of having a, a victory is important, um, and, and I understand the need to hold people accountable, but I think that the process of litigation is, is not really an incident that's going to contribute to healing and reconciliation. It's also in, in the current circumstances where you're opening uh, an old period of limitations, not going to result in one-off cases that can be adjudicated from beginning to end, but result in mass litigation and a, and a large number of claims. You've seen in New York since August, 700 claims have been filed. Uh, one diocese has already declared bankruptcy and others are expected to, to follow. So the impacts of litigation, especially if it results in bankruptcy, uh, of charitable institutions um, will have, I think, a, a, a detrimental effect on the larger community that's being served. I've addressed a number of these in my uh, testimony and happy to comment further. But frankly, if you're going to end up cutting programs and cutting people and cutting services as a way of, of being able to pay judgments, um, that has to have an effect, a measurable effect on the common good. Um, so let me close then with two words of, of uh, personal privilege. One is to the victims who and, and their advocates and their caregivers who are here. Um, I am very sorry for what you have experienced. What you experienced was wrong. It should not have happened. And under any civilized or normal charitable institution should never, ever, ever have been in a position of tolerating or looking the other way. That was wrong, and I thank you for your willingness to be here and to be able to be part of this conversation, because the conversation has to continue until we figure out what's the best solution. And then secondly, a, a word of personal uh, privilege to the chair. Thank you for hearing from this kid from Dallas, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm very much appreciate uh, the, the courtesies extended to be my you and your staff. Thank you. Attorney Wenger. Thank you, Senator. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm going to primarily talk with you about what happened in Minnesota after a window was opened in 2013 
and give some parallels to what I understand to be where you are today in Pennsylvania. Let me share with you that Pennsylvania is deep in my heart. I went to school in Pennsylvania. I met my wife in Pennsylvania. My wife grew up in Pennsylvania. We have three children who were educated in Pennsylvania. We come to Pennsylvania frequently. And I would like to start where Mark ended, which is, and as you started, Senator, that the sexual abuse that occurred in our country is horrific, is wrong, is unprecedented, and is unfair. And I praise those who are here today, and I pray for those who haven't yet had the opportunity to be heard or to come forth, period. I'm here to share with you what happened in Minnesota, as I said, so let me give you the context and then apply it a bit to Pennsylvania, if I may. Our window opened in 2013. As a result of that, the Archdiocese, because of a large number of claims in Minnesota, filed for bankruptcy in 2014. There were 450 claims filed. 90% of those claims were related to abuses that occurred from the 1940s to the 1970s. The greatest amount of those was in the era of 1970s. What happened to the victims that filed those claims in Minnesota? Number one, some of them were subject to testimony in the bankruptcy proceedings. Number two, they've had to wait a long period of time to try to get recovery. Again, the bankruptcy was filed in 14. As of today, I don't believe any of them have received recovery, but they will soon, six or seven years to get recovery. During that period of time, because as I told you, most of these abuses were very old, 17 of them died without ever getting a penny. There's a huge percentage of the monies that went to attorneys, give or take 40%. And um, there were significant collateral effects. So number one, the archdiocese had to reduce its staff because it needed to pay expenses associated with the bankruptcy and for the victims, to be clear. So what are the numbers? Staff was reduced by 7%. Wages were frozen. The archdiocese reduced its aggregate expenditures per year by 20%. There, were, there was a reduction in the giving to the Catholic Church. The annual Catholic appeal, done annually, a 10% reduction in giving. The number of people that donated to that appeal was down a much greater percentage. And there was an increase in the rhetoric that occurred, it naturally occurs in this kind of litigation. There were assertions that the archdiocese was hiding a billion dollars of assets. There was comments that there were disappearing assets, that assets were being shuffled aside. The judge admonished those that were asserting that to stop doing that because those were factually incorrect. This was the judge, not a competing counsel. The retirement plans, for those who put money aside for retirement, and the medical plans that took care of those who were in those medical plans, 3,500 people in the medical plan, as an example, had to give up funds to help to pay for the victim's claims. Some high schools had to actually pay for the land under their high school so that the high schools could continue to exist because the land was owned by the archdiocese. Um, funds that were set aside for a National Historic Monument which is what the cathedral in St. Paul is designated, were taken to help pay for the claims of victims. So today, where are we? That 20% reduction in the total spending in the archdiocese, it's still at that level, hasn't gone up. There hasn't, the reduction in the annual Catholic appeal, the 10% reduction, it's still there, it hasn't gone up. The number of people who are giving has decreased. Some schools have become financially fragile, some donors have turned elsewhere. Parish donations in general are flat. And there's been a distance created between many organizations in the Catholic Church that were really tightly linked together. So think about that. That was all during an era when we had booming stock markets, a raising economy, and yet all those donations were flat or just call them flat for simple terms. So what does that do? You know, what's the reality of a reduction in expenditures? Well. There's less money to help the poor, the handicapped, those with AIDS, those who are divorced and separated, refugees. You, the, the diocese, as just to contextualize where we are, there are three million meals per year provided by Catholic-related entities in the Twin Cities area. 
There are 5,000 places for homeless to sleep. There are 2,000 low-income housing units, and there are um, 30,000 children in schools. 25% of the population is in Catholic schools. And all of those have had some degree of stress as a result of this. Juxtaposing that to Pennsylvania and just Philadelphia, the annual budget for Philadelphia is $4 billion a year, pursuant to a study by the University of Pennsylvania, the same place where Professor Hamilton works. And the aggregate expenditures of Catholic-related entities in Philadelphia is $4.2 billion a year. So these are very significant social good uh, elements. You know, in Minnesota, the victims were very clear that they wanted three things, and it was in this order. Number one, they wanted the protection of children. They didn't want to see this ever happen again, and they wanted to see practices put in place to make sure that doesn't happen. Jeffrey Anderson, one of the primary attorneys for a victim, said that we have the best diocese in the country in terms of the disclosure policy. So policies were put in place. They wanted transparency. They wanted to know who the abusers were and that that would be forthcoming. And of course, they also, and last, wanted compensation. So I'll just pause. I have some thoughts on comments that were made by others, but I'll maybe interject them in your questioning to say, I like the way you, Senator Baker, teed this up, which is we're trying to find the best way forward. And I would suggest that the best way forward for a whole variety of reasons is not through the litigation process, but to find a better solution. And I would ask the senators to think collaboratively with your experts in the audience about how do we get to a better solution than litigation. There are substantial shortfalls in the litigation process, and I think through a journey together, victims would be better off through an alternative solution developed. We can talk about that at some point, but I'll pause. Thank you, Attorney. And, and I realize that for some folks, what's being said is not um, something that they support, and I, I respect that you are showing that civility to the panelists while you don't agree or share their perspectives. I, I greatly appreciate that, that you're allowing them to have their, their, their thoughts. So I, I, I just want to have that statement um, out there as well. Attorney Benjamin, uh, we greatly appreciate you being here as well. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, I am a partner with the Beard Legal Group PC, which is a law firm located in Altoona, Pennsylvania. It focuses its services on representation of Pennsylvania public school districts. Our firm currently represents 45 Pennsylvania school districts in the capacity of solicitor and approximately 49 school districts in the capacity of special counsel. And we also serve on numerous insurance panels uh, in which we serve as defense counsel to Pennsylvania public school districts. As a partner, I've spent numerous years advising Pennsylvania public school districts, as well as handling the defense of and resolution of civil lawsuits filed against them, which include cases which have outlined allegations of sexual abuse or other inappropriate conduct engaged in by school employees. I'm appearing this morning on behalf of our firm in order to highlight what we believe are important questions to address with respect to uh, the impact of eliminating or otherwise altering the statute of limitations applicable to civil actions arising from sexual abuse or other sexual misconduct towards children. In this respect, I wish to emphasize that our firm, as well as the school districts that we represent, maintain the utmost compassion for victims of child sex abuse and fully support the committee's efforts to examine and determine the best means by which to protect children and to provide support and ensure justice for victims. We do applaud the General Assembly's accomplishments in recent years relative to further clarifying and establishing guidance for public school districts and their employees with respect to legal obligations and related expectations applicable to them. Uh, this is serving a purpose for our Commonwealth's children and the overall public interest in protecting against uh, and pre hopefully preventing sexual misconduct. And I'm not present this morning on behalf of our firm to discuss the constitutionality of any expansion of the statute of limitations or to advocate against uh, expanding opportunities for victims of child sex abuse to pursue adequate remedies. What I am here to do is offer brief remarks on the particular considerations of public school districts uh, relative to the alterations of the statute of limitations and the potential amendment of the Political Subdivision Tort Claims Act to provide for an exception to tort immunity. And that is based on the public school district's more unique status as stakeholders uh, 
relative to this legislation because they are, of course, publicly funded institutions. And we have to echo some of the same concerns regarding the impact and cost of litigation in that respect. Uh, the General Assembly may very well decide that negligence that results in or otherwise causes sexual abuse or sexual misconduct to occur or continue is an area of exception that it wishes to recognize with respect to the governmental immunity that is typically enjoyed by school districts. Our concern in that regard and with expansion and with respect to expansion of the statute of limitations uh, is to ensure simply that legislators ask the questions and give appropriate scrutiny to how our Commonwealth's public school districts will handle a wider breadth of claims, many of which may be several decades old and could very well be predicated on theories of negligence that are extremely and, and inherently difficult to respond to uh, and to evaluate. There will be difficulties, as my colleagues on the panel have already identified, in evaluating the validity of such claims, taking on the cost of litigation, um, in circumstances where there's a likelihood of stale evidence, scarcely available records, and difficulty locating and accessing witnesses to answer critical questions of who within an institution may have known or should have known that some form of misconduct was taking place and what actions they had taken or not taken. These are the questions that are applicable to an evaluation of uh, school districts' liability currently, and we anticipate that it will be a daunting task for school districts to obtain the type of information necessary to appropriately evaluate the claims asserted against them. Uh, we make these points not for purposes of suggesting that costs should not be borne by school districts or other institutions that have facilitated or failed to address actual knowledge of sexual misconduct by its employees. We can all agree that Perpetrators of sexual abuse and misconduct should be subject to severe punishment and that institutions such as school districts cannot be permitted to ignore actual knowledge of such wrongdoing by its employees. However, when we look at the manner in which employers and institutions and particularly publicly funded institutions can or will be held responsible for, for, the, for this type of conduct um, or the omissions of its employees, we do note a need for attention to be paid to concerns such as the prevalence of insurance coverage for claims of this nature being held by school districts over the past decades and whether any such policies that might apply are going to be sufficient to, this, to support school districts in the defense of or the potential settlement of these types of claims. Additional questions may be raised with respect to how the courts will evaluate standards of care applicable at the time of the alleged acts or omissions and overall, we ask that there be uh, scrutiny given to what options school districts in particular will have when faced with the dilemma of undertaking the costs of litigation in a difficult defense uh, or for pursuing an early resolution of settlement in order to provide a remedy to victims who are able to state actionable claims. Both of these alternatives will be onerous for financially strapped public school districts that have an extremely limited ability to raise funds. And given that these funds are those of the taxpayers, we would urge the committee to conduct further inquiry to the greatest extent it is able uh, with relevant resources and experts on the topic, such as public school funding, the history and other information relevant to the availability of insurance, uh, and the types of funding structures that could be utilized in the event that school districts have to undertake the cost of defense and the cost of settlement uh, in the absence of available insurance. We note that with the expansion of these claims and any adjustments to an immunity defense, the school districts will not be as readily able to dispose of civil litigation at earlier stages. And with this being the case, there may be a significant likelihood of substantial costs being imposed relative to the defense of such cases. Attorney, I, I, I think you've hit Thank you. many of your key message points as well. I, I have a, I know there are a couple members who have questions, but I have a, a, a simple um, question in terms of record retention yes. and what what is the length of time for whether it's a school district or um, a nonprofit or someone else to retain relevant both um, personnel or information pertaining to, how, how long do you retain those records? Right. 
The most prevalent record retention policies maintained by public school districts will have a record retention schedule that typically identifies a period of four to six years to after an investigation has closed to maintain records. At, and at that point, if they are diligent in following the records management schedule, they may very well be disposed of. Uh, that's something that school district policies can change. Um, and when there have been threats of, in the future, but it obviously looking back retroactively would be problematic because they may, may very well have disposed of these records. I will also comment that the prevalence of these record retention schedules that provide a greater degree of obligation for public school districts to pay attention to what, what when they're disposing of records really began to be disseminated more um, widely across our school districts only in 2008. So prior to that, we can't even guarantee that they would have maintained records beyond that point. Would either of you like to comment on record retention? I don't know if, uh, well, if you can answer specifically for your, um, in your experience in the bankruptcy, but generally my nonprofit and religious clients tend to keep personnel records, you know, for the life of the individual. And, and beyond, because you never know when there'll be a question about benefits or death benefits or payment of a pension or an insurance claim or something that occurs, even if somebody had terminated their service, you know, 20 years ago. Very good. Thank you. Um, Senator Haywood, followed by Senator Langerholt. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, Mr. Wigner, I have a, a question for you. Um, you described what I counted was nine losses to the uh, diocese. Uh, now, first of all, is this a statewide diocese or a municipal diocese? Municipal. Municipal. Okay, so you described nine uh, losses from staff to a monument to loss of giving, which I think is related to reputation, loss of the monument, had to move land around to protect some schools. So my question to you is, um, are you proposing that we allow the victims who have suffered the violence to continue to accept their suffering so that the archdiocese can finance their operations? Are you financing the archdiocese based upon the violence uh, perpetrated? So what I was trying to suggest, Senator, throughout my comments was that I believe that there is a better way to address the harm to the victims than through litigation and opening of the window. And my basis for my comments were twofold. Number one, the experience that I tried to share with you about what happened in Minnesota after the opening of the window and number two, because of the number of alternatives that have been identified here in this hearing and elsewhere, that when considered sort of um, in their totality, could result in a better way to address the full harm and the full needs of the victims. Those are the points I was trying to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Senator Langerholt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your testimony. The, Mr., this uh, t question being directed to Mr. Wenger. The Minnesota uh, window, as you testified to the uh, effects on that, my question is when the Minnesota window was open, did that encompass all avenues of sexual abuse, all with the same standard, anyone coming back, not just the church? Yes. And as a follow-up to that, after that was opened, after the litigation uh, ensued, was there an acknowledgement and or a removal of clergy that were responsible or named in that? Uh, my question being, did the diocese then, or whatever diocese, did they acknowledge that behavior? Did they remove? If so, how many did they remove? And are the clergy now in Minnesota not subject to allegations, are they, if you get, I don't understand where I'm getting at. So I, I'm going to try to answer, there are about four or five questions there, I'm going to try to get them all. If I miss one, just recircle if you would. So number one, 
there was full disclosure of those who have had claims asserted against them at any time in the past made publicly in Minnesota on the website for the Archdiocese and anybody that has ever had a claim submitted against them has been turned over to the police. The police have been in to look through the files, literally into the vault. And so now you're, so, so number one. Number two, was anybody removed? There has only been, I believe, two assertions of any misconduct since the early 2000s. And both of those individuals were removed uh, as a result of the allegations against them. The timing of when they were removed, um, one was removed, I believe, after the window was opened. I believe both of them were removed after the window was opened, uh, but, sh but they were removed shortly after sort of the allegations, I would say, became public. I, trying to be simple as opposed to getting into the deep of the cases, but am I getting to your questions or is it others? Partly. I, I want my guess is or my what I'm trying to, to lead up with this question is that as a result of the window being opened, that the diocese would have acknowledged this behavior, would have removed and would have kept further children safe. That's what I'm getting at. Did yep. that have that effect? Did they acknowledge that? I understand where you're getting at, that they're going bankruptcy, but maybe that's a wake-up call that they need. Yeah, so thanks. So I, my, I, my question I, is, I got it. was that, in fact, did that, in fact, happen? What was, was, the, was the diocese more fervent post-window than before, right? Answer, no. Let me expand. Um, we did some disclosure uh, full disclosure, I was intimately involved in the disclosure. We, we did disclosures pre-window because it was the right thing to do. We put in extensive programs that were uh, needed in order to assure that our children are safe in our diocese now. Attorney Wenger, um, I would appreciate if, if perhaps you could um, put that in writing Done. for the members of the committee. Our, our next panel is here and they have a, um, a, a time constraint for, uh, so I, I hate to interrupt you, but Senator, is that all right? If you could do that. That's fine. Thank um, you, And lay that out. Um, I think that would be very helpful. We greatly appreciate you all being here and I know there were two other members who wanted to ask questions um, but I appreciate your deference given the fact that our final panel for before we break for lunch has has a flight to catch so thank you very much Thank you, uh, Madam Chair before before the panel leaves Mr. Wenger maybe you can just follow up because there has been some um, concerned with, at least when I look at your testimony, some of the goals of the Minnesota statute I think you, you talked about, um, and I think you, you enumerated a couple of them, protect children uh, for the future harm, transparency, uh, accountability. But, but what, about, what about the ability to, um, um, for the victims to be able to, to have their own justice in terms of you know, the ability for victims to heal, for the victims, helping victims uh, to come forward and being able to, to deal with the trauma about coming forward. You know, um, as pointed out by my, uh, my colleague, Senator Muth here, um, every victim should have the option of deciding their pathway to healing and justice. That's different from saying every victim. So, I mean, could you be able to... You if, know, if you would like to, to follow, right. follow up in writing and, and share that, we will share that. That was one of the important points that um, uh, the Senator Muth and other members, of, at least on my, in my caucus, are, is, is to stress on that one point about those victims being able to have their... And I think Senator Haywood brought it up as well, too, um, that there is every, every victim... Uh, the way that they heal is not the same, and I think we need to, to take into consideration for that, and I didn't hear that in your testimony. So if you could forward right to the chair, I appreciate that. Th thank you very much. Um, and our final morning panel includes... <laughs> Sorry, not the final panel, the, the, the almost final panel before the morning concludes. Um, Honorable uh, Lawrence F. Stengel, uh, retired chair of the Oversight Committee Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Independent Reconciliation Reparations Program, K-12 
Kenneth R. Feinberg, Esquire, co-administrator of the Church Compensation Fund for Pennsylvania, New middle. York, and New Jersey, and California, and Camille Biros, Esquire of the Church Compensation Programs in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and California. Good morning um, and welcome and um, I don't, I'm not sure who would like to begin. Mr. Stengel? Sure. Good, good morning. Good morning, Senator Baker and the members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to be here today. Uh, I'm Lawrence F. Stengel, and I chair the uh, Independent Oversight Committee for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia Independent Reconciliation and Reparations uh, Program. Uh, I uh, retired a year ago from the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, where I served as uh, chief judge, uh, for, and I was on that bench for 14 years uh, sitting in Philadelphia. Uh, and prior to that, I served as a, a Court of Common Pleas judge uh, in Lancaster County. And in fact, my only other appearance before this panel uh, was in, the, uh, uh, in October of 1990, when then Governor Casey appointed me to be a, uh, a judge of the Court of Common Pleas, and I sat at this table with uh, Senator Noah Wenger and, uh, uh, and Senator Gib Armstrong, uh, and uh, uh, the committee, of course, is very different, uh, but it's a great privilege to be back here uh, and to uh, see uh, one of our outstanding Lancaster County Senators uh, here on the Judiciary uh, Committee. Um, I want to talk this morning uh, about the Independent Reconciliation and Reparations uh, Program. Uh, you have my written statement. Uh, I want to just hit some of the highlights, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Our program was launched on November 13, 2018. Claims processing continues uh, through today. Uh, the program was designed by two nationally recognized uh, claims administration experts who are seated to my right. Uh, Ken Feinberg and Camille Byros, uh, based on their uh, uh, long experience and input that they've received uh, from uh, victims. One of the unique aspects of our program is that we have also uh, involved an independent victim support facilitator, Lynn Shiner, uh, and uh, uh, I will talk uh, a little bit later about uh, Lynn Shiner's uh, uh, great con contributions. The duties of the Independent Oversight Committee were to approve a protocol appoint Ms. Shiner as the victim support facilitator, and we oversee the implementation and administration uh, of the program. Uh, as part of our oversight role, we've issued uh, interim reports, which I'm happy to provide to the committee uh, if that would be helpful. Uh, we also work uh, with the Archdiocese to review and improve Archdiocese internal best practices uh, to serve the community, uh, to protect children, uh, to improve interactions uh, with victims and survivors and preventing uh, future harm and protecting uh, public safety. The Archdiocese has had a victim program in place uh, for 25 years. Uh, we are actively involved in the review of that program along with Ms. Shiner. Uh, it is our belief that the IRRP has been a successful program and provides a strong model for addressing the concerns of the survivors of clergy abuse. It is victim-centered, uh, and it is well-supported. It offers a trauma-informed uh, program where survivors can come forward, disclose the harms that they have endured, and obtain assistance in a way that respects their dignity. Much of this support comes from Lynn Shiner, uh, our victim support facilitator, who is herself a survivor of violence uh, and loss and is an award-winning author and victim uh, advocate. She's the former director of Pennsylvania's Office of Victim Services, and she, in her career with Pennsylvania, oversaw the distribution of in excess of $100 million in state and federal funding to meet the needs, needs of crime victims throughout the Commonwealth. She has been a guiding force behind the creation of the program and the ongoing uh, implementation of the program. The program is fully independent of the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese does not control the process, uh, including compensation awarded to each uh, victim and survivor. It simply pays the amount set by the administrators on a claim-by-claim -claim basis. 
And I think that's a, a, a very important point to emphasize, and that is the independence of this committee. The program is confidential. Uh, it was designed as a confidential mediation process under Pennsylvania law. A victim is free to share any information he or she would like to share about the abuse that person has suffered. The program agrees to keep the victim's personal uh, information confidential. Uh, this is crucial because in many respects, uh, victims do not wish to make their experiences uh, public. The process of making a claim about childhood sexual abuse involves sharing deeply personal information about the nature of the abuse, the impact that has had on their lives, uh, and, and this program respects that confidentiality. The program uh, protects victims' private information uh, and records. Uh, nothing, however, about the program's confidenti confidentiality extends to protecting information about perpetrators. Uh, victims and uh, survivors are free to talk about the program to the extent they wish to talk about it. Uh, any new allegation uh, of abuse that comes through the program is reported immediately uh, to law enforcement. The interests of fairness and due process are well served by the program. Each survivor has a full opportunity to provide details about the abuse suffered uh, and the devastating impact that this abuse has had on his or her life. Uh, they are not limited in the extent of the information they can provide. Uh, there are no evidentiary rules. Uh, they have the right to be heard by the claims administrators, uh, either in person, uh, by phone, uh, by video conference, uh, or they have the right to request a formal hearing uh, before the administrators decide the appropriate uh, reparations amount uh, to offer. Uh, the independent claims administrators carefully and thoroughly consider all information provided uh, they are nationally recognized neutrals. Uh, it's actually a great privilege uh, to work with them. Uh, they've handled claims in a variety of different cases and uh, involving traumatic circumstances. Uh, they give careful, thoughtful, and fair consideration uh, to all claims. Uh, the program is non-adversarial. Uh, victims are not required to face uh, depositions, cross-examination, or the trauma of having their records or their past uh, scrutinized and challenged. The opportunity to be heard is entirely the victim's. Uh, the victim gets to tell his or her story to the administrators, uh, and they are not confronted by counsel for the church or by any representative from the church. Uh, it's entirely voluntary. If the victim registers uh, for the program and submits a claims package, uh, that uh, uh, victim uh, goes through the process. If they do not like the award that they have received, uh, they have every right to decline that award. Uh, we are running right now at about 98% acceptance of the awards that have been made uh, by, the, uh, by the claims administrators. There is no monetary cap on the amount that the archdiocese will pay. Uh, Mr. Feinberg and Ms. Byros uh, decide the appropriate amount of financial compensation, and this, not, it, this is not negotiated with or appealed uh, by the diocese. And there is no cap on the fund uh, imposed uh, by the archdiocese uh, whatsoever. Uh, it is pro-law enforcement to the extent that any new allegations of abuse that surface through this program are reported immediately uh, to, uh, to law enforcement. Uh, it is prompt and efficient. Uh, in the IRRP, the administrators strive to handle claims uh, within 90 days. Uh, from my 28 years of sitting as a trial judge in state and federal court, uh, I can tell you that this is remarkable speed. Uh, the average civil litigation can last anywhere from two to four years. Uh, victims tell us about how difficult it is to come forward uh, with these complaints, and having a long, drawn-out uh, battle in uh, civil litigation uh, is, is another circumstance uh, entirely. Uh, I make this point only to emphasize that the prompt disposition of these claims in a secure, confidential, and non-adversarial environment uh, is a tremendous benefit uh, to the survivors. Um, I'm going to defer to uh, the claims administrators to talk about the, uh, uh, the numbers of claims and, and the method for, for disposing the claims. Uh, I can tell you, uh, just in closing, that we have received a number of very positive comments from victims uh, who were uh, skeptical of the program, uh, but who have uh, told uh, uh, Lynn Shiner uh, and the committee uh, that their experience uh, with the program has been uh, positive. 
Uh, it is a very good program uh, in our view. Uh, it is a uh, form of restorative justice, uh, a concept uh, I think that is near and dear to the hearts of anyone who's involved in uh, uh, criminal justice or civil justice. It is an acknowledgement of the deep harm caused by the church. It is a fair and impartial evaluation of a monetary award and an opportunity for counseling and emotional support. Uh, I realize that this testimony today comes in the context of proposed litigation about statutes of limitations. Uh, the Oversight Committee uh, has no view on that legislation. I'm simply here to provide the perspective that the Independent uh, Reconciliation and Reparations Program has been successful in accomplishing its uh, stated objectives. And I thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Judge. And um, attorneys, if you would like to provide that update, we would appreciate that. Your Honor, my name is Kenneth Feinberg. In the interest of time, I defer to my co-administrator, uh, Ms. Camille Byros, who is in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the five programs in Pennsylvania, and I think it fair to say is more knowledgeable about all of these programs that we have designed and administered around the country than anybody. So I'll gladly defer to Ms. Byros in the interest of time. Well, thank you, Senator Baker and members of the committee for this opportunity. If you could uh, pull your microphone a little bit closer, your, your voice is, that is better? much better. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Feinberg mentioned, we are the administrators of uh, compensation programs implemented in the state of Pennsylvania for five Pennsylvania dioceses to resolve and compensate victims of sexual abuse as a minor by clergy of these Pennsylvania dioceses, which include the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and the Diocese of Scranton, Erie, Pittsburgh, and in Allentown. In addition to the Pennsylvania programs, Mr. Feinberg and I have implemented similar compensation programs nationwide, including programs in the states of New York, New Jersey, California, and very soon Colorado. The key elements of these programs are as follows. The programs are independently administered by Mr. Feinberg and myself. There is no second guessing. There is no interference from either the diocese or the oversight committees. Participation in these programs is entirely voluntary. No individual claimant is required to participate in our programs, and only if and when a victim decides to accept the offered compensation um, is a release required for them to sign. Courtroom rules of evidence and legal defenses which might bar any litigation claim, in particular the statute of limitations, which may preclude successful access to the courts, do not apply. Each claimant can voluntarily request a confidential and private opportunity to be heard by the administrators. I believe we've uh, uh, interviewed at approximately 500 individuals at this point uh, for, the, for the nationwide programs. All of the programs offer each claimant the access to the individual diocese victims assistance coordinators who will provide referrals for mental health counseling and therapy and also arrangements for reimbursement <coughs> of treatment. The programs are entirely confidential on the part of the administrators. However, the victim reserves the right to speak freely about any aspect of their compensation, their particular case, or the process. The programs are efficient, as Judge Stengel uh, mentioned, and cost effective. Between 90 and 120 days uh, to completion of a reviewed claim. Lawyers are welcome, but not required for submission uh, of these claims. We provide pro bono legal assistance for all claimants to have uh, a, a thorough explanation of the release prior to uh, the victim signing a release of their rights. And I'll just order the following, uh, what I consider key statistics. The number of claims we received for, uh, in all of the Pennsylvania programs as of September 29th, which is a couple of days ago, 1,255. We've paid out to date for Pennsylvania programs $53,223,000. And nationwide, we've received 2,889 claims and have paid out nationwide $281,773,000. We are happy to answer whatever questions. Thank you all very much uh, for being here. Um,
Judge, I, I noted that um, the time frame to submit ended on September 30th. Um, when we scheduled this hearing, I was unaware that that was the date of, of the ending time frame. Is that something that you will revisit in the future, um, potentially to open that up for victims um, down the road? Or, um, and the other question I have is, what happens to an individual who um, comes before you that maybe you weren't aware of a perpetrator, that nothing had been filed? How do you handle that type of claim for someone who um, maybe didn't appear on some list or wasn't, um, someone that you had identified, but that someone else has come forward and presented as, as a perpetrator? Sure, at, at the outset of the program, uh, the, the uh, committee sent claims packages to all known survivors or victims uh, who had been known to the church and who had reported uh, their, their circumstances uh, to the archdiocese. Uh, we found uh, uh, probably half of the uh, uh, registrants uh, in the program were people who were before this program opened not known to the archdiocese. Some of those involved allegations against uh, clergy uh, which were not previously known to the archdiocese. Those were immediately reported to, to law enforcement. Uh, so there's no, uh, there's no uh, waiting or, or differential uh, between people who were previously known to the archdiocese and people who are new uh, to the pro process because of this program. Uh, their claims are all handled in the same, uh, the same way. Um, I think in terms of your, your first question, uh, the uh, uh, closing date, the, the program opened in November of 18. Uh, we set uh, September 30th of 2019 as the closing date. Uh, the claims processing uh, uh, will continue for uh, as many months uh, or years as that takes. Uh, uh, the, the sense was that there was a benefit to having a finite time for the program. Uh, I am not involved in discussions about uh, whether the program would, would reopen or be continued. Uh, that certainly is an option to the archdiocese, uh, and, and I expect we will be consulting with claims administrators and with the archdiocese about whether that's something they wish to pursue. Uh, just to get back to your question about um, newly reported claims versus the known population of victims. So from, from the outset of the program, as uh, Judge Stengel has mentioned, we had a list of known victims and we reached out to them immediately. We also allowed, um, with the, the, the date of implementation of the program, we allowed for a registration process. So we said to the public, if you were abused and never before came forward, and wish to do so now, please register through our website and give us the basic information. We will get back to you. We will uh, determine an initial eligibility to move forward in the program. And if we determine that you are potentially eligible, we will send you the complete packet of materials to uh, participate in the program. There are a number of claimants who, as I believe you mentioned, Senator, cannot identify decisively who the perpetrator was. So we attempt to work with them to get as much information as they can provide. Uh, and, uh, a sort of a description of, of, of their appearance, where they were, how old they were. We work, we're very um, in touch with the claimants, particularly when they have difficulty, and particularly with the new claims, so that we can assist them in, in bringing in a valid claim. Um, and I, I do want to note that Senator Regan is here. Um, I, uh, it, as you have relayed to us about your experience, obviously you are also um, executing funds in states that have windows. H how does that process work when you say a release to sign? So when someone agrees they sign a release, they're not permitted to use the window, is that correct? So, uh, that's correct. So, so the, the state of New York announced at the end of January, I believe, that the window was, the legislation would pass. Since the end of January, we still are receiving claims for various dioceses in the state of New York. So the, the, the individual has the opportunity now to come into the program, to go through the process, to see what the determination is on eligibility and the amount of the offer, and then make a 
determination. Do I want to accept this and sign a release, or I'm not happy with the compensation offer? Do I want to now move forward and uh, file a lawsuit? So they have an option. Thank you. Other members, questions? Senator Farnese? Just, just a very follow up real quick. Um, there's reference in the materials uh, to the large volume of claims that were filed in the last 60 days. Do you know what the, how many were filed in the last 60 days? We, are, we believe it or not, we're still counting them because the, the deadline is uh, that the claim must be postmarked by September 30th. So yesterday we received just, uh, just under 200 new claims and the day before 50. So those are not included in these stats. We're still counting and see, it's sifting through the volume. Thank you. Senator Pittman followed by Senator Yaw. Thank you. You um, mentioned, I believe, your payouts to date were approximately $53 million. Yes. Did all of those payouts go directly to the victims, or were some of those dollars used for the administration of the fund? None were used for the administration. They all went directly to the How, how is the fund paid for from an administrative perspective? From the individual diocese. Do you have a perspective of roughly the proportion of the administrative cost versus the direct payout of the claims? I, I, no, not as I sit here. Okay. The reason why I'd asked that, we had heard testimony from the prior panel, which I, I would like to see follow-up documentation on the claim that Minnesota, approximately 40 percent of, I believe, the bankruptcy proceedings were, were tied up in fees and costs related to that process, and I'm just trying to compare that with, uh, with your operation. So, thank you. I think uh, Ms. Byros can comment, Senator. I think something like half the people, individuals, who come into these programs come in without lawyers. They are pro se. They file on their own behalf without a lawyer. The other half, roughly, have decided that they uh, will, will use a lawyer. That's completely up to them individually. I'm glad you brought that up. How, how complex is the filing process? It's, it's a, a, actually quite simple. It's a, a seven or eight page application form, which basically asks them personal information, where they live, uh, contact information, and a brief description of what happened to them, when it happened, where it happened. And, and do you ever deny claims? Um, there, yes, we do. Uh, we have an, I, I believe our percentage of acceptance uh, uh, is about 89, 90%. Okay, thank you. Senator Yaw. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I think that the panels this morning have uh, pointed out the uh, uh, challenge that we have in trying to satisfy compete, some competing interests here. I know that there are, there are advocates out there, and I understand that uh, you know their goal is retribution at, at, at all costs. It's ret retribution, uh, and sometimes I, I get the feeling we will just remove the statute of limitations, the civil statute, and you know we've done it and let the court system operate, and for the next I don't know five or ten years to resolve it. I am not sure though that that's the best thing for victims, and and. I have talked to people that you're absolutely right. One of your observations is the non-disclosure, that people don't want to relive it for eight to 10 years or five years or whatever it takes and hire attorneys and do that. And there is that part of it out there that I think that we have to address. One of the things that I would ask you, do you, have, you don't have a non-disclosure agreement. You know, if they go through your process, there's no, they can still talk about it. They can still go to the press, for example? Absolutely. They, they can. can. They, they can go to the uh, press. They can, they can speak to whomever they wish about it. And I, I just want to add one, one thing, if I could. Um, we hear time and time again from the victims that we see that it's not about the money. It is absolutely not about the money. It's the acknowledgment of what was done to them and the harm that was done to them that they're interested in. What, what about... Uh, uh, I assume there's some kind of a release that, that if they accept your the funds that you provide, then they're giving up a right to uh, file a lawsuit. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And everyone who, who signs a release has the, if they're not represented by counsel, they're provided with a pro bono attorney uh, to go over the release with them and explain to them the, the legal ramifications of signing a release. 
In, in the average time from beginning, uh, you said, I, I think, is 90 days? Roughly 90 days. Yeah, that's yes. accurate. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I Just one follow-up question. You do not represent uh, the Diocese of Harrisburg. Is that a different process? Or you? So you represent all other dioceses? Uh, we, we don't represent Harrisburg and Greensburg. And Greensburg. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. So, what is the estimated cost of, of treatment um, of the victims for the victims since you've started the the organization has started? My first question. What is the estimated cost of the their estimated treatment? cost of treatment? I, you know that I, I we don't get involved in those issues. Okay. Those are issues that are worked with the individual diocese in terms of their reimbursement of of their care costs. Is there any availability um, for ongoing treatment? With, within the diocese? Yes. Uh, my understanding from the diocese that we work with, that they all make available to the, to the victims ongoing uh, referrals and, in many cases, reimbursement of uh, costs for these uh, various therapists and, and counselors. And finally, do you have any estimation you could point us in a direction where there might be an analysis of the uh, difference between uh, the recoveries in litigation versus the recoveries in terms of uh, at, with your organization? I guess, in terms of the um, uh, amount, uh, that type of thing. I know the time, in, in you, you sort of mentioned how long it, it takes in terms of uh, litigating a case, claim with the organization as opposed to full-blown litigation. How about the, in terms of the recoveries that are the amounts? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that recovery amounts in our programs don't match recovery amounts in a, in a successful lawsuit. You, you basically are saying they're higher in the, in, the, in the lawsuit. They're higher in the lawsuit, Thank you. yes. But, but of course, I would just add that, as, as Ms. Byros just said, a successful lawsuit and how long it takes to litigate, whether the uncertainty, whether you'll prevail at the end of that litigation, whether the, uh, the diocese will be able to pay the judgment. I mean, those are all, you know, considerations that I think lawyers and clients factor into decisions as to how to go forward. And just to add one more point, the level of support and corroboration that we require is significantly different than what's required in a lawsuit. It, there's no, if I could just add, Senator, there, there's no burden of proof at work here. Uh, there's no motions practice. Uh, and the, uh, in, in 28 years of sitting as a, a, a civil and criminal trial judge, uh, I, to follow up on Mr. Feinberg's point, uh, there is a, a marked difference between a successful lawsuit and an unsuccessful lawsuit. In our civil justice system, uh, many, many cases result in defense verdicts for all kinds of reasons. Uh, in this case, the, the, the emphasis is on identifying the, the loss uh, and, and coming up with a fair and, and adequate uh, compensation payment. I and, just, and I don't, I agree with you, judges don't know in this context if there is such a thing as a successful right. lawsuit for these victims. But I think thank that's you for a great your... point. If, if I could also add, you, you asked something about ongoing therapeutic uh, treatment. The Archdiocese, uh, through two different offices, uh, has uh, spent over the years $13 million uh, to support victims' therapeutic needs. Uh, that was before this program was implemented and, and continues through today. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further questions, we'd like to thank you for your participation thank you. and thank you. Uh, thank you. appreciate your being here. And as additional information becomes known, if you could share it with us, we would certainly thank welcome you, that. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Our final panel before uh, we break for a short lunch break is Suzanne V. Estrella Esquire, the legal director of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape and Michelle Minor Wolf, MA, Executive Director of the Victims Intervention Program of Wayne and Pike Counties. <coughs> Thank you. Estrella, if you would like to begin, and if you could pull the microphone close to you so that um, we can all hear you. Thank you. Certainly. Good afternoon. Chairwoman Baker, Chairman Farnese, I'd like to thank the members of the committee for convening this public hearing on the statute of limitations. It's my pleasure to testify today and to address this very important issue. 
I want to start by expressing my thanks to the courageous survivors who will give testimony later today. And I want to apologize and say that I'm sorry for the tone of this conversation and that it seems that we are somehow weighing the survival of institutions over and above the survival of the victims that they are designed to serve. And I hope that in the end, that this legislative body will prove that that is not the case. My name is Suzanne Estrella, and I am the legal director of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. In my role as the legal director, I manage PCAR's Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project. That is a statewide project that provides legal representation to survivors of sexual assault throughout the Commonwealth who cannot access free legal services in the counties where they reside. The project began in 2017 and will soon expand with the new federal grant that we've recently received. Through the comprehensive legal services that we have been providing in this short period of time, we have served over 100 clients. We've gained a greater understanding of how vitally important statute of limitations reform is in Pennsylvania for those who are seeking justice. On an even broader scale, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape works to eliminate sexual violence and advocate for the rights and the needs of sexual assault survivors and has been doing so since 1975. Our coalition works with a network of rape crisis centers that provide counseling services throughout all of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. Our positions are informed by those communities and the, their connection with the families and the communities that they serve. Sexual harassment, abuse, and assault are serious and widespread problems. One in three women, one in four men experience some type of sexual abuse, assault, or harassment in their lifetime. Across the country, every nine minutes, a Child Protective Service Agency substantiates a claim of sexual abuse against a child. In this past fiscal year, Pennsylvania local rape crisis services centers served over 22,000 victims of sexual abuse. Of those victims, over 2,000, almost 3,000, were adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Child sexual abuse is an exploitation of power that takes away a child's right to healthy and trusting relationships. What we know from the research and frontline advocacy experiences of rape crisis centers, the Rape Price Center Network is that delayed reporting of sexual assault is the norm and should be expected. The myriad of reasons why a victim chooses to delay reporting are embodied in our cultural climate, a climate that blames victims, normalizes sexual assault, and ignores the magnitude of the trauma associated with sexual assault. The imprint of trauma on a person's life will influence if, when, and how they choose to come forward and to talk about what happened to them and to get help or not. For children, these barriers are compounded by things like age, cognitive development, vocabulary, the ability to understand what's happened to them, uh, knowing where to go for help, the confusing and complex emotions that may um, accompany the assault, the status that the person may serve in their community or within their family, things like fear of being blamed or getting in trouble, and so many other barriers that children should never have to face in their lifetimes. What is it about our systems of response and our communities that makes it so unbearable for a victim to come forward that the choice to suffer in silence seems to be the safest. We can tell a lot about our society by the way we treat the individuals who are most vulnerable or who have been harmed. What we say and do about sexual abuse matters. What is abundantly clear is that roadblocks like victim blaming and the statute of limitations have become intolerable. Justice demands accountability. This legislative body has the power to pass legislation and in so doing create pathways to justice for the citizens of the Commonwealth. Embedded within our system of justice are time-honored principles and rules of law that provide protections for those who are accused, 
Eliminating or extending the statute of limitations will not alter these principles. The accused will still be innocent until proven guilty. The rules of evidence will still apply, and people accused of wrongdoing will continue to have the opportunity to defend themselves in a court of law. The bills before this committee will provide an opportunity for survivors to be heard, to seek justice and compensation. The Clergy Compensation Fund established some financial relief to victims abused by clergy members of the Catholic Church. It's limited, and as been previously discussed, the time to file a complaint has expired. And while the number of victims revealed by the Altoona Johnstein report is staggering, all victims do not fall within this group. There are many victims who are victimized by other institutions, whether they be religious or non-religious, other community persons, and other people that they come in contact with. A one-size-fits-all remedy just doesn't work because the victims are so diverse. PCAR supports legislation that ensures victims have multiple options and pathways to justice and healing. Victims deserve options for economic compensation as well as civil and criminal justice remedies. The economic cost associated with sexual assault has been estimated to be $150,000 for one rape. The lifetime loss that a survivor may suffer is over $200,000. That includes um, lost wages, as well as um, services that are now required, such as counseling and therapy and things of that nature. This legislature is not being asked to create a new cause of action, but to acknowledge the reality that in sexual assault cases, statute of limitations provide a layer of protection for predators that is unconscionable. We can fix this. We can give survivors an opportunity to be heard, to seek justice and to seek compensation. There's been significant debate on the constitutionality of this issue. As it, is, as it is written, the remedies clause applies to plaintiffs and their ability to access the courts. The bills at issue are not creating or removing any cause of action. The bills are extending liability, a procedural change, not a substantive change. Pennsylvania courts have held that these types of procedural changes do not violate due process. Some actions are clearly too egregious to warrant a vested right in no longer having to defend them because too much time has passed. It's inequitable to suggest that those responsible for a crime should be allowed to go unpunished because their victim is too young to speak up and later too late to demand justice. We must move forward. Far too many citizens of the Commonwealth are without redress. Statutes of limitations reform is the most pressing legislative priority facing us in Pennsylvania. Our current statutes do not reflect the actual life experiences of victims, but instead impose arbitrary and confusing time limits on victims and the legal representation is almost like a victim blaming sentiment in itself. It's normal for adults to wait decades to talk about what happened to them. It's also common for victims to come forward when they learn that the person who abused them can or has abused others. It's time to pass reforms in Pennsylvania that reflect what we know about trauma, about reporting, and about the needs of victims throughout the state. If we fail to act, we are not only silencing current adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, but we are endangering the lives of the children in our community today. Thank you. Michelle, Michelle, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us here today. As I was looking at the agenda, um, I'm really pleased that the survivors are at the end of the day because we learn best from them. And those are the voices that really, really matter. Not to minimize any of the people before us today, but in our local programs that I represent, um, we learn best from the survivors and the victims that we have served over the years. Anytime we make a major decision at the local level, we get their input. So I commend you for having them, having time slots for them to speak today.
today. Um, as you notice with my testimony, I won't read it due to the time, but I am the executive director of Victims Intervention Program that serves Wayne and Pike counties, but I am also a member program of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape and the Eastern Regional Rep for the membership programs for the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. So we do network quite frequently and we look at the issues that tend to be very common amongst the people that we serve and the trends that we are finding. As has been stated today already, victims and survivors come forward later in life. I don't know that I personally is, have ever had a survivor that I've worked with that has come to us uh, before the age of 30. So I'm seeing people, even, let me back up, even though I'm the director, I do provide some direct services. So the people that I have seen have come to us at age 40, 50, 60. And the brief story that I mentioned in my written testimony was about the gentleman that came to one of our events in our, our town park. He had to be 70 or 80 years old. He brought a little box or something, a crate to stand on because he was smaller bent over a little bit, he had a cane, he was shaking, and he asked to speak, and he got up on that box and told us that at the age of around 10 years old, he was sexually abused by his Boy Scout leader. He never told anyone until that night in this public local park. He said he didn't even tell his wife, who was no longer with him, but the reason that he decided to tell that night is because he said he did not want to take it to the grave with him. People needed to know. So there's many other stories like that. We could go on all day about people coming to us later in life. And I think with the statute of limitations as it is now, misses way too many victims. And as Suzanne was saying, I've heard a lot today about the Catholic Church and the sexual abuse within the Catholic Church. This is so much bigger than just the Catholic Church. There are abusers everywhere in every denomination, Boy Scout leaders, teachers, coaches, fathers, stepfathers, usually people that these children trust. So they have layers of betrayal they have to work through in their mind. It takes years before they even understand it, and then even more years before they get the strength to come forward. And they deserve to have their voices heard, and they deserve to have justice too. In terms of the Victims Fund, for one, that only applies to people that were um, victimized within the Catholic Church, but it also then doesn't give, it's, it's limited and it doesn't give them the opportunity to speak out. And we did have a woman who did um, agree to that, but she did not go with an attorney and she did not understand that, she, that that would stop her from any lawsuits in the future. And she said she would give back every single penny if she had the opportunity to do that so that she could have her voice heard in a different setting. The other things that I heard today about um, victims, it's not about the money. It is about stopping it from happening in the future and stopping it from hurting other children. That has been consistent through all of our years of working with victims and survivors is they just want to protect the person behind them. It's not about the money, although they could use it because if you really look at their lives, so many of them, at least the ones that we have seen, either they drop out of college, they can't hold jobs as much because of all of the trauma. And I won't get into that because that was discussed a little bit um, ago with Suzanne. But in, in closing with that, it's about accountability. If we really want to stop abuse from continuing at the rate it is continuing now, it's about accountability. And that is how it's going to prevent. Until we can show that there are severe enough consequences for people who abuse children and adults for that matter, it's going to continue. And we know they just move people out of their positions and they move on to other places. There has to be a strong enough deterrent. And whether that is bankruptcy of a particular institution that has a lot of it or something else, it needs to happen. And really, if we want to see a long-term prevention of child sexual abuse, it comes down to accountability. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, please, we, I, I had asked about keeping the clapping to a minimum. I know you're, you very much appreciate and, and I respect that. And it's not that I'm silencing anyone. I, I, um, I, I'd like to say that um, we tried to strike balance in bringing various perspectives, as you can see, today, and I really appreciated um, your focus on pathways to justice and healing. So you've laid out several things, including uh, the statute of limitations as, as one key component. Um, I guess I'd just raise a question for both of you, and I've worked with Michelle Minor Wolf for probably 30 years um, and, and greatly respect the work she does in our communities in Northeastern Pennsylvania. As we look broadly at pathways, so you mentioned the victim funds aren't available for everyone. 
we know perpetrators who uh, preyed on children and were children themselves, that very difficult for them to get perhaps the kinds of services. I know what we've done to add um, the ability for children's advocacy centers across the state, the program court appointed special advocates um, and it, trained trauma therapists. Are, are there things outside the scope of what you've presented today that you would like to recommend to us? I, I, whether we hear a lot about young individuals at college age who are not still uh, children per se, but they're young people forming um, who experience a great deal of trauma. Should college age children, young people, have access to um, trained trauma therapists? Should, what are some of the other things, you've advocated the window and, and you've done that very, very well, but what are some of the other things you think that we ought to be considering as we look at budgets? Not, not necessarily saying a fund per se, I think someone misinterpreted what I meant earlier, but enabling existing programs and line items that we have. Where do you see that need? How big is that need? And um, what would your recommendation be to us on how to improve upon that? I definitely think there's a, a great need for prevention dollars. If there um, could be an increase in even to um, the local rape crisis centers and the money that they can use for prevention. Because you mentioned um, college campuses and some of the cases that we've had come forward where um, the perpetrators act as if they actually don't even know that what they're doing is offensive. And that's sad. So we need more money in prevention dollars. Now, that's at another level. Of course, people know when they're sexually abusing, when you're a grown man and you're having sex with a five-year-old, there's no prevention needed for that. You just know you're wrong. But at the college level and, and early on for children, if we could start some prevention work where um, children are having the opportunity to learn what a healthy relationship looks like, what it means to say no, how do you give voice to certain things that normally children are just not um, educated to give voice to, I think that would be very helpful. Yes, thank you. And, and to follow up on the trauma-informed services, there are um, sexual assault, sexual abuse, sexual harassment services across the Commonwealth in all of the counties. And we are trauma-informed. And the local programs that they speak of do not charge victims and survivors to receive services. However, it is hard for us sometimes to be able to keep very qualified staff who have been with us a while because we cannot pay them the salaries that they can receive in some of the profit organizations and mental health places. So when you think about budgets, um, it could be something to help us sustain our good counselors that have been with us for years that are trauma-informed and to have some of those benefits that are in other parts of the world in um, that kind of work. Senator Farnese followed by Senator Regan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so in your testimony and, and the materials we talked about when folks were coming out even later now, 50, 60, 70 years old, what about um, a lot of the things I begin to hear is, um, I guess, uh, children now deal with parents that may have been abused, have gone through their victims themselves, um, and, and how children today, you know, that are adults today, some of them may even be only children, dealing with a parent that may have been through, through this. I mean, you know, we talk about you know, the children, but as we know already, we, we know that this affects, you know, as we said, men, women, adults, Cosby, we had a hearing last week, um, Senate Democrats had a hearing last week um, where um, we, had, we got into extensive discussion about the effects of, of what are the, these victims are, what they, the effects on them, and um, specifically in the Cosby case and other cases like that. You know, for me, what, what, is, you know, what is there in terms of treatment and, and, and counseling for folks that are trying to deal with with parents that may be beyond the age of, of going, getting help, or, or not being able to want to get help? I mean, is there, are there, are there um, outlets for, for those types of individuals as well, too, that are, that are dealing with, um, you know, dealing with victims that, you know, are, are, no, are not children. They're, they're grown adults and, and victims themselves, and they've, they've, it's happened to them at a very young age when they were children. 
mm-hmm. or even, even young adults, and it comes out later on in life and trying to deal with that. Is there any, was it, do you see that as, a, as, as coming out, especially with folks coming out later now? And, and if so, you know, what, what help is there for, for those types of folks? That's the majority of who we see, actually, at the local programs in the Commonwealth. Um, the children, they will go to the CAC, which is a very good thing, and then they may or ne- may not come in for services at that time, but the majority of people we're seeing at the local level are adults who, that, who re, uh, experienced child sexual abuse as a child by a parent or any of those other people that I had mentioned earlier. So they can come in for the trauma-informed counseling. We have support groups. We have so many different services at the local level that people can benefit from, it's, it, but it's not the judicial system. And that, again, that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And again, you know, focusing, you know, on, I know we're focusing on children right now, but as we know, um, many adults um, are, are dealing with this on a daily basis as well. Um, you know, how do we, in terms of legally and, and, as, a, and as, I guess, as the Commonwealth, begin uh, to offer healing to those victims as well, too, I mean, you know, that, are, that are out there right now that are not, that are trying to deal with themselves on a daily basis? I mean, what, how do we, how do we really get our arms around that? I, mean, I think we have to create a climate that um, allows people to come forward and seek help. Um, often the, the clients, the calls that we do receive from people who are outside of the statute of limitations often are seniors, and um, they are still embarrassed by what they experience. So um, trying to, we work closely with the centers in the community where the person resides to make that connection so that they feel comfortable going forward for for counseling and things like that. But just creating um, awareness in the community where people know that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to get counseling. And, and, and again, I mean, this is so that we, we sort of understand the broad scope here. Again, we know we're focusing on children. There's, in the military, we have issues as well in the military. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, what some people will talk about is, you know, we don't want to maybe getting, getting into the conversation with regard to adults is, is even more uncomfortable at times. But that is a, a, a huge, can you just sort of talk about in terms of what, what the statistics, what we see in terms of, of coming forward adults as opposed to children? What the, what the numbers are? Hmm. That's something that I could provide later, but I can't say for certain right now across the Commonwealth what the numbers would be. But we can provide that. You yeah. would provide that back through the chair. I, I will share it with all the members of the committee. Um, Senator Regan, followed by Senator Haywood. Thank you, Chairman Baker. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. And if this was covered, I apologize. Madam Chair, I um, got here a little bit late, but I'm, I'm interested in if PCAR tracks suicides amongst victims of rape or sexual abuse. Um, I'm not certain that we do, but I certainly could find out, but I'm not aware that we have a number of that. Is that, is that something from your, maybe anecdotally through your own experiences, is that something that, that happens um, as a matter of course with some victims? Yes, absolutely. It is not something that we track in our in our data software across the Commonwealth necessarily, and most of them are not completed suicides, so to speak. But there are plenty of survivors who have attempts and thoughts about it um, because they it's all about hope, and they feel that there's no hope left. No, you know, we are in a very victim blaming society still, and they do come forward, and they're either not believed or they're blamed in some capacity, or they're totally estranged from their family, kicks them out, all sorts of things like that happen to them. Um, we did have, unfortunately, a completed suicide from an older woman. I think she was, well, I shouldn't say older, but um, in her 60s, who actually then did die by suicide after all of these years. So it does happen. We have seen um, survivors that become inpatients, you know, for, for really inpatient intensive care for some of the things that we're working with. And it's hard for them to get closure, and I think that's where the lack of hope comes in, is we can certainly work with them with all of the counseling and the therapy and those kind of things, but there's still that piece where they want to, affa- they want to face their abuser in some capacity. Okay. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Regan and uh, Senator Haywood. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Either now or maybe submit to the uh, chairwoman uh, why, in your opinion, 
the two-year window should apply to adults. Almost all the conversation we've had today is about why it should apply to those who were abused when they were children. Um, but we do have a piece of legislation that's broader this gen to the application of uh, child uh, sex abuse. So uh, I know we're running out of time, but if, if, if you could get that to the uh, chairwoman, can, we'd appreciate uh, I can provide that. the adult focus. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions, I want to thank you for your attendance and participation. We are going to take... Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see you at the end. Senator yeah. Santacero, I apologize. That's okay, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you both for um, coming in today and for your work. Uh, and I really do appreciate the comments before about um, the role that litigation plays because we see it in a lot of different contexts. Uh, obviously, this one, sexual abuse, is one of the most e extreme and where the consequences are so grave. Um, but we often, often see how the threat, the very threat of litigation can often cause particularly institutions to act differently than they otherwise would. Uh, and I think we've seen that pretty clearly in the context of sexual abuse cases as well. In fact, I was, I, I was um, amazed earlier. We had an earlier panel that was uh, making an argument that sounded like if an organization is engaged in charitable work, it should never be subject to litigation, which uh, seems to me to be, uh, begs the question, I mean, why would that be? If it's, it's one particular institution, should not that rule apply to everybody? And, and um, that, was, that would lead to some strange policy uh, 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 results uh, from my perspective. But I want to ask you uh, specifically, because a couple weeks ago we had a hearing on this issue and heard from some very compelling testimony from um, victims, uh, including one gentleman who had served uh, in the military. Um, and if you could expound a little bit on your experience of victims uh, uh, from the military of, of sexual abuse. And, and how those cases um, have been treated. Well, I know across, um, across the country, there's been a lot more emphasis on the military um, using trauma-informed services. I think they've, they've made some strides in becoming more sensitive to the issues and addressing the issues and um, letting service, member know, service members know about their rights and what's available to them. Um, in various deployments, and I have seen them do quite a bit more um, involved with training and being trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive. But I'm sure that there's still um, quite a ways for them to go, but I can say that I have seen that um, over the past two or three years where there's been quite a push for the military to be much more involved from a trauma-sensitive um, standpoint. True, it's getting better. But what we're seeing from the, what I'm hearing from the survivors themselves is they are often somehow discharged, not dishonorably, but discharged from the military for speaking up. And, or they get demoted or they get sent somewhere else and they're silenced in different ways once they come forward, which is just a re-victimization of what's going on for them. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Just one final question is, as we look at the modern day with social media and texting and, and, and all of that in terms of how you, how you serve individuals um, in, in the community, do you find the bullying and the, the attempts against um, survivors through uh, Facebook and social media, is that, is that a problem, is that an issue? or? Is it still um, kind of underground because people don't come forward as soon? I don't know that it's specific to survivors of sexual abuse, but the bullying that goes on on social media is over the top because people are very quick to be judgmental and critical and say terrible things when they're sitting behind a screen and, instead of to that person. But. Um, Although I can say, for, for if we want to talk about teens in high school, if something has happened to them and somebody in that school or a friend finds out, then it does go all over social media, which then they don't want to talk anymore, they don't want to be doing anything because they're humiliated, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, even though it wasn't their fault. But social media can be very, very cruel 
and they can make victims out to be very bad people, and that is not the case, and it goes along with that victim blaming culture. Yeah. So. And I, I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to assume that you are both in support of Marcy's law and the constitutional amendment. And yes. um, I, do you believe that that will have an ef effect moving forward as we elevate the rights of, of victims into our constitution? Yes, I think it definitely will have a positive effect um, here in the Commonwealth as victims have the opportunity to be heard and uh, systems realize that they have to be responsible to the individuals and it's not the convenience of the system that's being upheld over the needs of the victim. So I think it's very important. Thank you both for being with us. That um, will conclude our morning panels. We're going to take a short recess for lunch and come back at 1.30. Okay. Thank you.
I'd like to call the recessed meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee to order for the second um, afternoon panels of today's informational hearing on statute of limitations reform. Joining us to begin our afternoon panel are Greg Rowe, the Director of Legislation and Policy for the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, and Sean McCormick, the Chief Deputy District Attorney here in Dauphin County in the District Attorney's Office. So, Mr. Rowe, would you like to begin? Thank you. Sure, and, and Sherwin Baker, as always, thank you for the opportunity uh, to appear before uh, your committee. And Chairman Farnese, thank you as well for the, for the same opportunity. Um, members of the committee, uh, what, what Sean and I want to do in our, our brief period of time up here uh, is to touch on the uh, issues regarding criminal statutes of limitations. What we want to do is to be able to provide some help with, particularly with, with background and some of the legal issues regarding them. So we want to discuss what they are, how they work, and again, what some of the case law is on applying the criminal statutes retroactively. And then Sean is going to uh, discuss uh, some of the cases and issues that he's worked on as he's prosecuted um, sexual abuse, rape cases, particularly those involving children. Um, so what is a criminal statute of limitation? Uh, a criminal statute of limitation sets the limit on how long charges uh, or when charges must be filed by uh, regarding a criminal act. It sets a limit. Uh, they are done by statute. And that is, frankly, the reason why you see different statutes of limitation lengths in different states. Each state enacts uh, its own statute of limitations uh, on, on various crimes. The purpose, what's the purpose of a criminal statute of limitations? And our, our courts have defined the purpose, I, the purpose is, I think, pretty succinctly and accurately. Um, our courts have said that a criminal statute of limitations limits exposure to criminal prosecution um, to a certain fixed period of time following the occurrence of criminal acts. And our courts have gone on, gone on to say that limitations are designed to protect individuals from having to defend themselves against charges when the basic facts may have become obscured by the passage of time. So that's really the background in terms of what limitations are, why they're there, and how they are enacted. In Pennsylvania, our statutes set forth a, uh, a a little bit of a complicated structure in terms of uh, the number of years and, and exceptions to those. So let me again, try to briefly hit uh, what they are to provide some context. The general rule, the general rule is if the crime is a summary offense, the criminal statute of limitations is 30 days. If it's a misdemeanor or certain felonies, two years. If the crime is what's called a major felony, which are the more violent, more serious felonies, five years. Uh, if it's a murder or homicide or an act committed in relation to that, uh, that homicide, there is no applicable criminal statute of limitations. So that's sort of the, those are the defaults. There are a lot of exceptions. And again, just to sort of quickly hit what, what some of those are, and I think really relevant <coughs> to the hearing today, um, if the crime is a major sexual assault, and that's a term that's used in the statutes, so those are uh, many uh, sexual assault crimes in Pennsylvania. Um, the five-year limit does not apply. Um, the tw it is a 12-year criminal statute of limitation. However, if the victim is a minor under 18, the victim will have until he or she turns 50 years of age. So in reality, then, uh, it would be no less than a 32 years applicable statute of limitations. Adding on to that in terms of exceptions, just to complicate things a little bit, are, are what's called tolling provisions. And tolling is, pause, is, is a synonym for pausing. And there are circumstances by which an otherwise applicable criminal statute of limitations may, may, may pause. And we have some examples in, in, in the testimony. If the person is not in the Commonwealth and does not reside in the Commonwealth, for example, you're going to pause the, the statute of limitations. If the victim's a minor and there's been physical abuse in the house and the victim has been unable to, uh, to, to, to speak or, or identify the harm, the statute of limitations is, is going to toll. If there's fraud, uh, if it's an act by a public employee, we're going to see uh, tolling. Certain human trafficking crimes uh, will be tolled as well. There, the human trafficking that involves sexual servitude of a minor 
has a much longer period, but even those human trafficking crimes that either don't involve a minor or do not involve sexual servitude have some of these tolling provisions. Um, and the, the last sort of uh, legal point I want to make is re with regard to the retroactivity, again, in the, in the criminal context. Um, criminal statutes of limit, uh, a newly enacted criminal statute of limitation uh, really cannot be retroactive. And there are, the leading case on this is from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in the early 2000s. It's Stogner versus California. And that was a, a case where the legislature in California enacted a, a, uh, a, a new criminal statute of limitations, gave victims a little bit longer uh, to have charges filed against their perpetrator. It included instances where the existing criminal statute had ended. And, the, and there was no change to the underlying crime. Those elements remained the same. So it was solely an issue about the length of time. And the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, said, no, no, that violates uh, ex post facto laws, violates due process. If the time period has expired, again, for criminal statutes of limitations, uh, you cannot apply them retroactively. However, uh, one thing to note is, if you still have time left on your criminal statute of limitations, and the legislature does enact a longer period of time, you would fall under that long period of time. It's when the criminal statute has completely expired that you can't be brought in. Now, none of the legislation would, would do that, but, but again, trying to at least lay out what, what some of the, uh, the law that we all have to keep in mind as, as we're looking at these important policy issues, that's uh, the Stogner case is, uh, is, is a big one to uh, just, just to keep in mind. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I just want to give you an idea before I start talking of just the experience I have so you have a perspective as to uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been doing this for 24 years as of yesterday. Uh, I've been doing child sexual abuse cases as a uh, full-time prosecutor. The, over that time period, the statute of limitations has extended a number of times. When I started prosecuting these cases, the statute of limitations for most of the crimes that I dealt with was five years for the felonies and uh, two years for the misdemeanors. So I used to try to find out, okay, as of your 18th birthday, what's five years? To, to the date you turned 23, you had a statute of limitations. Well, certainly on the criminal side, for, for most sex assault crimes that I prosecute, we now see that the statute of limitations has been extended until a person turns 50 if they were under the age of 18 at the time when, um, when the crime was uh, committed against them. The, um, a lot of what goes into our decision making when we make decisions whether to file charges or not uh, one of the things we look at, especially when it's a delayed report, is, is the statute of limitations still good? Um, I do have people that come forward that are adults um, that want to report uh, crimes that occurred against them when they were children. And I have to go back again and look at when their birth date was and uh, what date uh, they can go up to as to how old they can be. Because there are people that are less than 50 right now but the statute of limitations has expired because, as Greg was just saying, when the statute got extended, their statute was already expired. And because of the ex post facto laws and decisions, uh, we can't go back and revive them on the criminal side. When we look uh, at an investigation, the things that we're looking for today, I can tell you have changed quite a bit from when I started doing this 24 years ago. Uh, 24 years ago, we had a system where the police would do an investigation, law enforcement, and on a separate side of things, children and youth would, uh, child protective services would do an investigation, and many times we were stepping on each other's toes. Over the years, we've, we've built things known as uh, multidisciplinary investigative teams, MDITs. Um, we work as a team. We coordinate our investigations between one another because there are tools that we have in law enforcement that um, children and youth and child protective services don't have uh, during the course of their investigations. We share information back and forth in an effort to build a good, strong, solid case. Because the last thing we want is a child or an adult to come into court and be the only evidence we have. 
uh, we want to try to find additional evidence to back them up in court. Uh, we don't want the, the classic he said, she said type scenario to play out in court because with the burden of proof being beyond a reasonable doubt, it's a very high burden of proof. And uh, we want to have the strongest case we can when we go into court. Um, so the investigation becomes so important. Uh, in recent years, we've seen the, um, the nurturing and, and the growing of child advocacy centers. Uh, I look at child advocacy centers as the glue that hold together these child, uh, these multidisciplinary teams. Uh, they are the place that we come together. And uh, if you're not familiar, I'm assuming everyone should be, but uh, maybe not. A, a child advocacy center is, it, it takes many forms. I tell you, we have one here in Harrisburg known as the Children's Resource Center. Uh, a child will come down to the Children's Resource Center and a trained professional will interview that child. Uh, someone who knows how to interview a child because there are special ways in which you interview a child um, that you might not be concerned about when you're interviewing an adult. You don't want to be putting ideas in the child's head. You want the child to be telling their story without the, in, the interviewer influencing that story. At our Child Advocacy Center, we also do a medical exam. Um, for two purposes. One, if we can find medical evidence uh, to back up what the child's saying, that makes our case that much stronger. But also just as important, it's important that the child has that medical exam for health reasons uh, to determine whether they have uh, a sexually transmitted disease or whether there's been any, unfortunately, damage that's been done to them and their body um, that needs to be taken care of in a medical setting. Uh, so. Those are the, are the things that we try to do on a normal case uh, to do and to coordinate our investigations um, to build a case that's the strongest case possible for a child in court. Um, we, we are, and I am, um, every day um, faced with uh, this crime. Before I started doing child abuse cases, I kind of had a very um, optimistic view of, of getting involved in these types of cases and, and maybe a simplistic view. I, I like to tell people that I went out and I bought uh, some Snoopy ties and you know, that, that was going to help me. And, and in some ways, the Snoopy ties have helped me over the years talking, talking with the kids. But I was not ready uh, in any way, shape, or form for the vast numbers of cases that we come have come in to our office and police departments every day in just little old Dauphin County uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, it shocked me the number of cases we have. Uh, we have two full-time prosecutors that, um, that do these cases full-time. Uh, we have other prosecutors in the office that do it part-time. We are devoting a significant amount of time and resources to deal with the number of cases that we have. Um, child sexual abuse is a huge problem, and it's a problem that I still think we're at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to investigating and prosecuting these cases. And finding ways, besides just in the court system, but finding ways outside of the court system to help these victims. Um, it, it is a monumental task. Um, the, the statute of limitations is something that I've had the conversation with victims that have come forward and, and talked and, and I've had conversations having to say, I, I'm sorry, um, but the statute of limitations have expired. Um, we're not going to be able to file criminal charges on your case. Um, but in those cases, we still do an investigation. Um, at least in our office, we still do an investigation because sometimes by opening up an investigation, you discover that there are other victims of this perpetrator out there. And although we're not able to get justice for that particular victim, we are able to obtain justice for that victim by helping another victim. Um, and I think you will find di di district attorney's offices across the state take a similar approach to these types of cases. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little perspective of some of the things that I deal with as a, as a child abuse prosecutor and certainly uh, am, will answer any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you both for being here. I want to thank you for the, the work that you do. And um, 
I know children, families, and all of us are grateful that um, dedicated people are there in the courtroom to be their voice um, because you take on an added role, a very important role of being the voice for that child who's obviously experienced great trauma. And we've heard a lot today about trauma-informed therapy, about trauma um, services, about what you do. And as we look at um, this whole um, complex and very, very staggering, the, the statistics, what would you recommend to us to help you do your job better in terms of the trauma component of it? Because um, so many young children face that trauma and then their life is forever changed. And, and so as you navigating that first step in, in the system, you're, you're the, really the first person that's going to help them navigate that. So are, are there things that you would recommend that we should be looking at? I know we talked earlier about children's advocacy centers. Um, I know in several of my counties in Pike County, they're looking at a forensic pediatrician from uh, CHOP in Philadelphia because we don't have any in the rural parts of our state to do through telemedicine that very important piece that you talked about with um, uh, the intake and the medical examination and doing it properly and in in a uh, in a way that that child is is feeling protected. Well, I, I think continued support for child advocacy centers is is a big thing, uh, a big way to help. I, I know our children's resource center is uh, expanding into areas of providing um, therapy and and I don't know if therapy is the the correct word for what they do, but pr providing that side of um, the help that, that we provide for children that are, are abused. Um, it's one thing to come in and be interviewed. It's another thing to have a center that not only interviews the child, provide the medical treatment, but also do follow-up. Um, and, and there I know are others. Our, our victim service program does that in consultation yes. and in cooperation, so I think that's, that's really helpful. And, and building partnerships in your communities between different agencies. Uh, we're not in it to compete with one another, but we should be working together, and that's the idea behind a multidisciplinary approach uh, to child abuse, uh, it, it, prosecutions, and, and helping children. Do, do you have a recommendation after working and speaking with so many um, Folks, some who don't present early, as you mentioned, who, who miss out on the window. Is that something you think, um, not the window, the, the um, statute of limitations to 50, is that something that you think we ought to be considering uh, a different number for? I, I think they definitely need um, support and they need some um, someone to talk to. And, you know, a lot of times, when, when, we, when I suggest that maybe you should get some counseling or something like that, a lot of times what I hear is, I can't afford it. Um, so you, you do have uh, that aspect of things. Um, if, if we were to change the crime victim's compensation oh, okay. to, to permit that as an eligible, for someone who hasn't, doesn't have the resources, doesn't, not, not, um, taking over, but adding that as a component that would be an eligible um, item. Would that be something yeah, you I, think I, would be I, valuable? I personally think so. I'm not completely sure of all the rules that go into co crime victim compensation. Certainly, we um, encourage our victim and our victim advocates in Dauphin County are kind of the experts in, in our area um, with uh, the crime victim's compensation and how to apply for that and all. But if, if it's not something that's currently uh, covered, it's certainly something I would suggest to look into. And we know when we change the age of a perpetrator and drop that to 14, um, how prevalent is the problem of um, siblings and, and sexual abuse among foster kids and those children in the system. Do you see a prevalence of that as a, an area that we need to continue to look at? Oh, I, I definitely think it's an area you continue to look at. Um, I mean, that's some of the stuff that surprises me is the juvenile and juvenile uh, abuse that occurs. 
um, again, it's it's something unless you're in immersed in in this type in this field that um, you would be surprised at the number of cases. I was stunned by the statistics when we changed the statute a number of years ago, and um, and and the idea that for many years that was unreported and and those victims. Um, were left out there to fend for themselves, and, and that was very troubling. So I'm happy that we changed the age, but I'm uh, deeply concerned about the prevalence that we see at, at that young age. Senator Farnese. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, during the, your testimony, you sort of, I think uh, um, Mr. McCormack may have identified the issue you have with the statute of limitations and how um, you may have uh, a predator or, uh, who is um, the statute of limitation has run for on, on some particular acts, but then there may be opportunities later. One of the things that's been noted by some of our members, Senator Muth noted this, that there's no increase under Pennsylvania law for, for penalties of repeat offenders. Do you think that that might be something that we could look into? Like we could have a serial predator, I mean, knowing that there are uh, increased penalties going along for, and would that possibly um, begin to help address the issues that you have with identifying, um, we have statute of limitations that may have run on, on certain victims, but then there may be opportunities later on to bring a, a charge against um, the same predator for another instance. And just, just so I understand, Senator, if, to understand your question, repeat penalties for future pre predatory Exactly, behavior. under Pennsylvania law, I believe we have, there's no increased penalties under Pennsylvania law. Is there right now for, in terms of increased for, for a predator that is you know, repeated acts? Uh, the only thing that comes to mind is if it's a, um, a second or subsequent right. conviction of, of a crime that requires registration under okay. Megan's law, there is a, a mandatory sentence that, that, that is applicable. Uh, that's not a new crime, though. It, it's, it's a change to the, uh, to the sentence, but it's, it's, it's not a new crime. So if, if there's a way to try to, to work on, on, on something with you that goes about it a little bit, a little bit differently, Yes. And do you think that that might be a, is that a, is that a, a, a tool possibly that law enforcement might be looking into to help address? We, we, yeah, when we, we, we absolutely like to be helpful to try to identify that we might need to create a, a new crime that, that, that would cover that. So I'm, I'm just trying to think really quickly about how to, how to, how to fashion that. If it's, if it's a new sentence, that might be a little bit harder in terms of bringing in uh, an unexpired statute of limitations, but if there's a new criminal conduct that, for which there, there'd be a, a penalty, I think that's something we can absolutely sit down and identify. Okay, if possibly, I mean, just looking at the number of, of victims that have come forward, you know, sort of uh, putting that into the analysis as well, possibly. If I might, what I've done in some cases is um, one case in particular I can think of where the statute of limitations had expired for two of the children of an abuser uh, they were now adults and the grandchildren were being abused, is uh, when it came time for sentencing, although we were never able to file criminal charges for the two women whose statute of limitations expired, they testified and gave victim impact statements at the time of sentencing. And I'm uh, convinced that their testimony um, combined with the um, testimony of the children in the case um, encouraged and, and gave the judge uh, the necessary uh, information to give a sentence that ultimately wound up being tantamount to being a life sentence uh, for that abuser. And I, I think the testimony of those two women uh, was crucial in that case. Um, so we can, in some ways within the system, still use um, the, t the information. I'm prosecuting a case right now where um, we have uh, six victims and we have three victims where the statute of limitations has expired and six victims that we're prosecuting. Um, we are seeking to introduce the testimony of those three other victims in the course of that trial. Again, if we, if we can find a way that a victim isn't coming into court by themselves without anything backing them up, we're gonna try to find that. Um, as for the, the recidivist, uh, mandatories, uh, if you are uh, been convicted of a, a crime that requires you to register under Pennsylvania's Megan's Law, a, a second offense, a new offense after you're required to register is a 25-year mandatory, and a um, third offense is a lifetime sentence. 
real, real quick, you, so you brought up the idea of um, having the the individuals that maybe the statute of limitations had run testifying in the case in chief in those the case in the, the current case before the court. Uh, have you ever had? Has there been any opposition to that in terms of because it, earlier today we had a, a professor talking about the uh, the property interest with regard to the statute of limitations. However, if the court is is allowing testimony to come in when a, when the statute of limitations are, has already expired and there is no issue with regard to to a constitutionally protected. Um, vested rights, so to speak, as one of the, the, the panel members identified. Did you see, do you see challenges, motion practice, based upon that particular element of the Constitution or that particular argument? That Certainly, the, there, there are, um, in every case I want to do it, there's a challenge. And it's, it's all taken on a case-by-case -case basis, and the judge has to balance the prejudicial versus the probative value of the evidence that's coming in. I have to show the judge that there's a link between that testimony of the victims that were not charged and the, and the victims that are on trial or, or presenting the case uh, against their abuser. So I have to make that link. If I can't make that link, then that testimony is kept out. But if I can make the link, then the testimony is allowed. Because I, again, I think that goes directly to the the proposition that you know somehow constitutionally we run into effect where there's a vested property right within a, 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 a statute of limitations. Um, however, if the courts are allowing, at least on some situations, to have testimony come in, I think at least as a, a lawyer, I think that would possibly undercut that argument. But again, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you both. Just one final quick question. Um, do you, would you support eliminating the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse cases? Yes. For, in, criminal, we, in, yes criminal? in criminal cases, we absolutely support eliminating the uh, applicable criminal statute of limitations for children. Yes. Do you um, have a similar opinion if it were adult? Um, we, as an association, we have not taken a formal position on, on, on that. Um, I do have district attorneys, who, uh, individual district attorneys who do absolutely uh, support that. Um, if language like that were added to a, um, uh, to a bill which eliminated the criminal statute of limitations, we would certainly continue to, to support uh, th that piece of legislation. Similarly, if it's not, we would continue as, as our focus has been on the uh, and and the children, so. Uh, Senator Langerholt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, I have the opportunity to sit on the Pennsylvania Sentencing Commission, and recently there is movement and discussion to review the sentencing guidelines because it's been some time since those have been done, and, and mainly dealing with some of the wide disparities between some of the OGSs versus the standard, sentence, standard range. And when you put your mitigated or aggravated ranges in, you've got a very wide range of sentences. That being said, uh, as that discussion continues, we'd be willing to work with the commissioner, provide input, as well as the, the district attorneys as to maybe now would be a good time to address those issues, to address those penalties, to address those sentencing areas that we can work forward here in the future. Uh, absolutely. I think the Sentencing Commission uh, provides a great opportunity to get into sort of those uh, gradations and a little bit of the minutia, which is hard to do with, 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 with statutes. So it's a, a long way of saying absolutely, Senator. Thank you both, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you for being here. Um, Thank you for having us here. Our, our next panel is panel number seven, and it is Sam Marshall from the Insurance Federation of Pennsylvania. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Marshall. You are, I didn't say, the president and CEO. So welcome, and you may begin. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, at the outset, I uh, want to emphasize a couple of points. Um, first, we strongly support your willingness to address child abuse. It's a plague. Um, we shared with the executive directors uh, the Sunday article uh, from the uh, comprehensive study, really, uh, from the Sunday New York Times on the problem of pedophilia today um, over the internet and in, you know, and, and in in-person dealings. Um, and the, you know, the problem of pedophilia, the disease of pedophilia, and the need to take strong steps to eradicate it 
uh, on a current basis. We appreciate the uh, test fires earlier this morning who said that actually the number one goal is to stop pedophilia now. Um, and so to that end, we strongly support the prospective reforms in House Bill 962 and Senate Bill 540 uh, that address that need to make sure that the abuses of the past don't happen to the children of today and the children of tomorrow. Um, nonetheless, we do oppose a reviver. And we talked about that, and we're going to talk about the insurance-specific end. But before I talk about that, I'd like to talk about reasons we don't uh, support a reviver. I mean, you know, I mean, and what, what we do and what we don't. Um, we, we don't oppose a reviver because we're unsympathetic to the victims. Uh, to the contrary, we have you know, the victims of the past whose claims are currently time barred. Uh, just the opposite, uh, we support things like the Victim Support Fund, ways to meaningfully give meaningful redress and the opportunity to uh, you know, confront abusers to those victims. Um, second, we don't oppose this because we're covering up or seeking to escape our own culpability as an insurance industry. In all the reviver debates here and across the country, nobody has suggested that any insurer has been complicit in, knew of, condoned, furthered, or profited from any of the abuses that would be revived under these bills. We oppose the reviver for a couple of reasons. First, we question the legality. We've heard scholars on both sides debate that. The Senate did that as well in 2016, and this committee and the full Senate passed a didn't, it didn't get enacted, but, but this committee passed a bill uh, and the full Senate passed a bill that said it had problems with a reviver under the remedies clause. Uh, we appreciate that you have before you, and, and we appreciate that lawyers on both sides are going to differ. That's what litigation is. It's lawyers with different points of view. We think that that's a, you know, we think to that end, if you were to enact a reviver, uh, it's going to result in litigation. It's going to take a long time. And, it's, and, and to that end, I think it's a false promise. I, it, it's an uncertain future. And that's a false promise for the victims, and that's a false landscape for everybody involved with it. We think that the approach in House Bill 963, which puts it to the people, uh, you know, let the, let the people of Pennsylvania decide on that. Uh, we think that that is, we, we, we have concerns as an insurance industry, and I'll touch on that uh, shortly. But we think that as a legal recourse, that's a more, that's a more certain and fair recourse. And I think, I, I think it actually takes probably less time than the courts will, um, just, just given the timing that was outlined uh, in this morning's deal. Going to insurance um, and our specific problem with a reviver, um, and it is retroactively creating liability without retroactively allowing for a premium. You know, insurance covers risk for which an insurer is able to calculate and charge a premium. Retroactive liability doesn't allow for the second part of that equation. When an insurer calculates and prices a given risk, it factors in, among other factors, the length of the applicable statute of limitations for that risk and the likelihood of claims being filed in that time period. Once the statute of limitations has expired, so does the insurer's ability to hold funds in reserve for that risk, because by law the insurer no longer faces potential liability of that risk. You just can't hold money if there's no liability, that, and, and that's what happens when the statute of limitations is passed. Uh, retroactively reviving liability under an insurance policy then imposes liability even if there are no reserves and when the insurer has no ability to price and collect a premium for that liability. That goes not only to the payments to third parties, to the injured victims, uh, but it also goes to the contractual duty that an insurance company has to defend its insured. And those legal costs, and, and that's just on the defense side, those legal costs in, in many instances are just about as great as the cost of whatever money goes out to the third party. I realize that concerns about insurance economics and mandating insurance coverage without allowing premiums to pay for that coverage, I realize that that's secondary for many and, and, and I respect that. As a victim, the concerns of the insurance industry are, are going to be a distant second. Um, nonetheless, those are important concerns and assuring the predictability and stability that's a cornerstone for the insurance industry. A fiscally sound insurance system has allowed insurance to answer many of society's problems and challenges. 
but insurance coverage isn't the answer to every social problem, especially if it comes at the expense of that fiscal soundness. That's why we don't believe that a reviver of insurance co uh, coverage is the answer to the problems and needs of victims of abuse. It isn't sound as a matter of insurance. That doesn't mean that ignoring the, you know, that doesn't mean we're, we're saying, gee, let's ignore the problems and the needs of these victims. They deserve a meaningful remedy. They deserve closure to the horrors of that abuse, and that includes the chance to confront their abusers. We think the victim support funds are one example of how that's being done and, and has been done in Pennsylvania and across the country. Um, as you see, other institutions, public and private, uh, being revealed to have dealt with the same, you know, have, have the same abuse problems, uh, you may need to expand something like that. Um, we, we would recommend that. Um, we were also asked uh, to touch on the Superior Court's June of this year, its decision in Rice versus the Diocese of Altoona Johnson. It's, it's early. I mean, the, uh, you know, the diocese there has petitioned the Supreme Court for Alicotter. Uh, you know, I don't know that the appeal has been granted, but it's, it's, it's underway. Um, uh, I would say, uh, and it's been described um, by some of the past uh, people this morning, uh, from this morning's session, and it is also covered in considerable detail in Professor and Koyak's uh, written testimony to the committee. Um, you know, as to the insurance aspect of it, um, one thing insurance coverage doesn't do, you can revive it, you can have the ongoing deal, um, what it doesn't do is cover the intentional wrongdoings. And that is in the Rice case, that's what's allowed to go forward even if it's time, you know, even if the statute of limitations is passed. It's that fraudulent concealment uh, that, that we get covered. The insurance policy wouldn't cover that. Um, as to what the total impact is, um, I mentioned that the duty to defend is in many ways just about as many of those legal costs are just about as much as the indemnity costs. Uh, whether that aspect of the insurance coverage would apply is very fact specific, it depends on how the particular complaint is pleaded. Uh, does it bring in a negligence claim? Is it just for the fraudulent concealment? That's going to be fact specific, and it's simply too soon to make a projection on what the impact of that is on insurance coverage. Um, I, I thank you for the chance to be here. Uh, we welcome the chance to work with you and, and your colleagues on meaningful reforms to address the problems of sexual abuse faced by children and others. Uh, Prospective reforms such as those in Senate Bill 540 and House Bill 962. And we also appreciate the chance to address those problems of past victims in a legal, effective, and fiscally sound way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Um, you talked a lot about um, the intentional harm and that you can't, you don't cover under the, the plans for the intentional harm. Would an individual then have supplemental insurance privately if you are um, protecting the institution? Would that liability then fall to their own insurance coverage or not? No. I, I mean, I, I, as a matter of public policy, uh, you would never allow an insurance company to cover intentional wrongdoing in, 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 in any form of, of coverage. Um, that's, that was an area that many people were not, not totally clear about. Um, and, and the duty to defend, um, what, what triggers the duty to defend? Some people say so the, the, the mere filing of a complaint, uh, but it is filing a complaint that is characterized, that, that is framed as triggering liability, insured, the, the insured liability of the of the, in, in this case, the institution, uh, but of the policyholder. Um, and that is, and that goes really to how the complaint is framed as opposed to how the ultimate resolution is, is done. Sarah Pittman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. You, uh, we, we received testimony earlier about, uh, I believe, 11 or 12 states who have instituted revivers. Do you have any uh, examples of uh, the consequences of that from your peers in those other states have you as it relates to some of the impacts you've expressed concern over um, you know nothing specific it, you know, it becomes it becomes very company specific I mean you know, 
a, frankly, a relatively small segment of the insurance industry was involved in insuring churches, uh, you, know, uh, you know, several decades ago. I mean, so, you know, there are a lot of companies that it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, they're not involved with it in any way, shape, or form. As to the particular companies, um, some of that is, uh, you know, I mean, some of that's in their SEC filings that they have to make as to what their potential liability is. But I don't have, and, and I don't think anybody has had anything in terms of the impact on companies overall. Some of it is that as those revivers have, have been done in other states, it's been over an extended period of time. So for instance, if you're a national company, um, Delaware does something, you know, that may not be uh, as, as big a deal on a national level. If you have a number of states doing it all at once, um, that becomes a much different scenario. Okay, thank you. Senator Farnese. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Um, sort of one of your, uh, during your testimony, you talked about the situations, um, I guess, Senator, uh, Baker asked about triggering coverage and the duty to defend. In those situations where the insured, you know, intentionally um, hides the fact and the, the, you know, in terms of with the cases we've seen in the church where there may have been um, you know, information disclosed or hidden from parishioners or, or the, the conspiracy theories in terms of, you know, where we've seen priests, you know, from one parish to another, where that information is not, is there's facts that would uh, show that it's either been withheld from uh, the carrier, um, whether it was, those, the, it was intentionally withheld from the carrier. Are there, are there opportunities where the carrier can then disclaim coverage based upon the conduct of the insured, or I guess in terms of it would be the archdiocese, if, if you're talking about a situation like that, does that come up? I mean, do you, are you faced with making those decisions where there is, uh, Conduct on behalf of the insured, which which, which did, could render um, a decision not to not to defend. Yeah, uh, um, not to defend depends on how the complaint is filed. Okay. Uh, you know, but but uh, certainly in terms of indemnity to third parties, that comes up. Uh, you know, which is one reason. I, you know, even in states that have done a reviver, it's not as if insurance companies have paid out all the costs. Uh, they, we we will pay for the complaint as it's grounded in negligence, not as it's grounded in intentional wrongdoing. And so to the extent that if during the course of the, of the case, the discovery part of the case, it, it comes out that the insured knew about it and, and, and withheld it, uh, intentionally moved individuals from powers to powers, does that, when that information comes in, when that comes to light, would that trigger at that point a opportunity for the carrier to say, well, based upon in intentionally withholding or fraudulently withholding information about the claims when you knew or should have known them, does that at some point trigger an opportunity to not defend the cases anymore? Um, you know, that, that becomes very fact specific. Um, it, it certainly triggers not having to cover the, indemnif uh, the indemnity <laughs> portion um, as to the duty to defend. That's that, that yeah. you can't. It's very difficult to give some sort of a general pronouncement on that. I mean, because I know folks have had, folks have had questions about that. Because with the backdrop of what we've seen with, in terms with the church and with the the, the allegations and, and coming out that there's been, you know, um, intentional. Um, transferring of individuals from parish to parish in order to conceal their conduct uh, to the detriment of the victims, does, when that comes out, but that would not affect the ability to defend. It might ultimately affect the, the ability or, or the obligation to, uh, I guess, to, to pay a claim at that point. Correct. And, right. and you, we, I mean, obviously the victims were, were, were the most victimized by, you know, the concealment uh, that, it, that had gone, that has gone on. Um, but that also triggers, I mean, from an insurance perspective as well. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Mr. Marshall, just one final question. I understand that California maybe has done an analysis of the impact of the window, not necessarily toward the insurance industry, but school districts. Is that anything that you're familiar with? Have you read anything about that? Or if you have any... Um, insight or information that you could share with us, that would be helpful. Okay, I'll, I'll ask. Thank, thank you. you. Seeing no further questions, um, thank you very much for your participation and your testimony before the committee. Um, that brings us to our um, panel number nine.
which will include um, Jennifer Storm, our victim advocate for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Oh, panel eight, I'm sorry. That's what happens when you read without your reading glasses. Um, Michael McDonald, SNAP leader of Philadelphia, Survivors Network of those abused by priests. Mary McHale, SNAP leader of Reading, Survivors Network, and board member for the PA United to Protect Children. And LaQuisha Anthony, founder of Voice, a training specialist with WOAR and a survivor and advocate. Um, Ms. Storm, I believe you are going to um, maybe introduce the panel and they will offer uh, their testimony to the committee. So you may begin. Thank you. Um, and thank you again so much for having us here today. It's a little closer. It's a little closer. Uh, I am Jennifer Storm. I have the honor and distinction of serving as the victim advocate for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, Again, I want to thank you for the ability for the survivors to be here today, um, to not just have one panel, but multiple panels, and to have multiple perspectives. I hope that you find today that these incredible warriors and survivors are going to share vastly different and diverse perspectives that will hopefully inform the decision making that you guys will have to do. So without further ado, I will um, have them start. And Michael, I believe you're prepared to lead off. Madam Chair and Senate members, thank you for allowing my testimony today. My name is Michael McDonnell. I live in Bucks County, formerly of the Narstown area, Montgomery County. Also very proud to be a SNAP leader, which is Survivors Network of those abused by priests in the Philadelphia area, and even more proud to be able to sit with all survivors today to share testimony to you. I was repeatedly sexually abused between the ages of 11 and 13 by two Catholic priests in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Francis X. Trauger and John P. Schmier abused me when they were assigned by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia to my family's parish in St. Titus of Narstown. The abuse took place from 1980 till 1982 while I was in sixth and seventh grade at St. Titus grade school where I also served as an altar boy. Both of my perpetrators were known abusers already to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. This allowed them to utilize their position in the Archdiocese to prey on multiple children. Shamir, who the Archdiocese kept as a priest, continued to support as he lives a life now of prayer and penance. He was a resident priest at St. Titus while teaching at Bishop Kenrick High School. Trauger, now laicized and recently charged earlier this month in Bucks County at the age of 74 with four counts of indecent assault and two counts of corruption of minors. His last assignment was 1993 to 2003 at St. Michael's Church in Levittown, PA. I was abused by him in 1981. He had six more assignments and hundreds of victims in between that time frame. I read over some of the affidavit of the cases uh, and the charges for Father, or excuse me, Francis Trauger. He has not changed his pattern one iota. Like Schmier, I first met Trauger while serving as an altar boy at St. Titus and was sexually abused by him during a trip to his home to the Pocono Mountains in June of 1981. Trauger insisted that I sleep with him in the only bed that was in the home. Trauger also ordered that I sleep in only underwear. When I protested, he stated to me, you are growing up now, Mike, come on. Trauger was a large man and known to have a quick and explosive temper. Fearing Trauger's temper, I complied. Trauger asked me to rub his legs and his back with the talcum and lotion. Again, fearful, I complied. I awoke to find my underwear was pulled down to my thighs. Trauger rubbing my penis. I was wet. 
I'm age 51 today. And I don't know if it was his ejaculate or mine. I jumped from the bed and I sat on the porch until morning. When Trauger came out from the bedroom, I told him that I was not feeling well and I wanted to go home. He didn't say a word to me the entire ride back. Driven by the shame brought on by the abuse, I did exactly that. I said nothing. Shortly thereafter, the Archdiocese learned that Trauger abused two other children that same summer. Two families reported to the pastor of St. Titus, and Trauger was transferred to another parish. The Archdiocese, as was its, its practice, they didn't ask to identify the third boy. That was me. As a result, I and other victims continued to suffer in silence and isolation for decades, letting shame fester and destroy my life. Trauger would go on to minister to children in the Archdiocese for a number of 22 more years. The verbal boundaries that my other abuser, Shmir, had started in the sacristy, one of the most holy places before a Catholic Mass. His perverse and masochistic abuse continued on trips to his shore home in Mystic Island, New Jersey, where he pulled my bathing trunks down and let live crabs crawl over my exposed body. This abuse has tormented me since age 11, with a lot of life taken from me. I suffered with severe psychological harm, PTSD, manifested with a number of other symptoms. At age 12, I found my anesthetic, and that was a drink. And I drank up until the age of 35 when I first got my first chance at sobriety. Being sober for the first time, I learned very quickly that the monkey was off my back, but the circus was still in town. I had set out in a form of retribution to deceive the archdiocese for over $100,000 in theft. I was convicted in 2010 of theft by deception, and I served my time, 11 and a half months to 23 was my sentence. I served 11 and a half, three work release. I was held responsible. I was held accountable. I remain accountable today. I came out a better man. And we say that holds true for the church. In contrast, my bail was $100,000 secured. My abuser recently was let go in his own recognizance of $250,000 and allowed to return to his home state of New York. I had to get permission to come here today. I received significant mental health and substance abuse treatment over the past two decades. Most of these lengthy treatments were funded by the state over 160 some thousand dollars in mental health treatment, long-term drug and alcohol treatment, outpatient therapy, medication, medical assistance, and food benefits. Paid for by this Commonwealth. Today I work as an intake specialist at a drug and alcohol <laughs> treatment facility. I love going to work. I continue to attend AA meetings four times per week and co-occurring disorder meetings. I'm an active participant in survivors groups, but I still continue to experience flashbacks and nightmare. Because of the havoc wreaked on my psyche as a young child by the leaders of trusted in the faith I trusted in, maintaining my mental health will continue to be an ongoing struggle for the rest of my life. Justice can heal wounds. This legislature has the power to stop the trauma from being handed down 
to other generations. Victims have long held the liability. Lives today are in jeopardy and survivors have been pawned. Adding time to this process is adding cruelty to the trauma. We listened to negotiations last November here in the Senate and I urge you to eliminate the statute of limitations moving forward so tomorrow's victims will have full access to justice. Open the window to justice for all survivors. Experts tell me that a window is constitutional. I have to believe them. Since 2003, grand jury reports from investigations into every Catholic diocese in this Commonwealth have recommended eliminating or suspending window legislation. I thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony with you today. I certainly would not oppose any questions if that's necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Baker. Push it. Thank you, Senator Baker. Thank you to the Senate Judiciary for allowing me to speak today. I will never get caught. These are the words that I hear over and over again in my head. The words that my abuser said with a smirk on his face. So far in Pennsylvania, the monster's right. I've been speaking out about SOL reform for years, coming to Harrisburg and speaking in the face of fear for our legislators to do the right thing. I'm exhausted. I'm disgusted. I'm in utter disbelief watching our system fail those who have been repeatedly wronged in Pennsylvania. My abuser has 40 years of documented abuse protected by one of the richest institutions in the world. He has continuously been moved, sent away, and then placed right back in a protected environment. After stepping away from the priesthood, this man continued to abuse and has been protected by other institutions by fear that they would have a bad reputation. He has been protected by our weak laws in Pennsylvania. These laws protect predators and by their existence, encourage an offender to intimidate their victims to silence. This predator walks freely in my city every day. And to the gentleman this morning that said, this is about the winners and the losers, I guess he's the winner in this case and I'm the loser and all the children and unprotected that walk around are the losers. I came forward at the age of 32 because I read that he abused another girl in my high school. Diana, I thought I was the only one up until that point. To my surprise, slowly, I started to realize over time how many times this man had offended. I was abused in an institution that taught me that this man was the closest next thing to God. That same institution taught me that I was the evil one and I was the sinner because of my sexual orientation. Alone in the world and nowhere else to turn, I went to the confessional to admit my sin. From that very moment, my abuse began and continued until I left for college that summer, ready to move on with my life. I stuffed everything down deep and I turned to alcohol to numb and escape the shame and the guilt. I got through life barely, slowly dying on the inside until I got help at the age of 32. It is at this point that my story turns from victim to survivor, doing what I can to stand up and to speak up for what is right. It amazes me that after the Pennsylvania grand jury release that so many states are doing the right thing except for Pennsylvania. The recommendations laid out by the grand jury seems to have been put on the back burner. I'm so tired of traveling to Harrisburg and witnessing only coming getting the job close. I watch time and time again as our senators and our representatives do not do the right thing. Is it weakness? 
Is it peer pressure? Is it fear? Stand up in the face of fear and do the right thing. We need a window. Our predators have been protected for years and continue to be protected largely in part by the Catholic Church. I continue to stand up whenever and wherever I am asked in the fear, face of fear. I walk around my city every day not knowing if I'm gonna bump into my abuser and I'm scared to do it, but I do it anyway. I challenge our politicians to stand up in the face of fear and do the right thing. Now for my opinion on the bills. I've been suiting up and showing up in Harrisburg for many years, speaking out and standing up for justice for all victims. It wasn't until the release of the grand jury report that I started to really look into my individual situation. My abuse occurred at the ages of 17 to 18. I put my trust in my abuser because I had no one to turn to. He grew me for months, and when I turned 18, a few months later, he sexually assaulted me. Was the Mary at 17 different from the Mary at 18? To me, the answer is no. I was still young, naive, and deathly afraid my abuser would spill my secret. To the courts, the answer would be yes. How is that right? I'm so grateful that we have experts in this field to untangle these bills. Just when I think I understand it all, something said complicates what I thought I knew. One thing I do know is that Senate Bill 540 makes the most sense. It includes all of the issues that we have been fighting for over the years. Most importantly, it includes the window, which is a must. It allows for justice against those predators that have been protected for years. It also gives survivors the hope of action now, not years from now. I am incredibly grateful for all the legislators, past and present, standing up and doing the right thing. Since 2018 release of the grand jury report, my message has been clear. To voice the importance of following the four recommendations of that report, Senate Bill 540 supports all of the recommendations. And in ending, nothing much has changed in my 10 years of coming to Harrisburg. One thing that has changed is that I was once part of a small representation of clergy abuse victims. But now, I'm part of a large army of survivors, advocates, and loved ones who are not afraid to stand up and do the right thing. I am proud to know and love these warriors, and I can tell you this, we're not going anywhere. I'm honored to ask to, be, to speak today. I ask that legislators stand up, look, face, look fear in the face, and do the right thing. Enough is enough. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the Senate Judiciary Committee for convening a hearing to address statutes of limitations in Pennsylvania. Thank you to my survivor family who has embraced me as the only woman that is African American a part of this group. My name is Lakeisha Anthony and I am a survivor. On a daily basis, I actively work to eradicate and dismantle the existence and the impact of sexual violence within our society primarily across the Commonwealth and the tri-state area. I work tirelessly at advocating for survivors and providing prevention education services through WAR, Philadelphia Center Against Sexual Violence, the only rape crisis center in Philadelphia. Community healing work through my organization, Voice, where I serve as the founder. I am combating sexual violence, turning over every stone that I can. Daily, my life is one of self-discovery, overcoming, fighting to create change I wish existed for me and that I try to embody daily. Some may say that that's a normal life. We all should be striving to live this way. Yes, that might be so, but this drive for, and will for change comes from a place that I wish I never knew and a place that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. 
The journey of self-discovery is not the typical journey of growth. It's a forced journey that is a direct result of my experiences of being a victim of sexual violence. It seems like a forever journey of understanding who I am, learning and adjusting to the ways in which surviving sexual violence has altered my life, and how to live beyond that. While I remind myself through two quotes that I live by that this journey is worth it, there are day days that are extremely tough after doing all the work that I do to contribute to stop this within our community. Some days are very hard. Last week alone, after conducting a, a mentoring group, I had a breakdown in my car where I screamed at the top of my lungs and I hollered at God asking, why does such, an, why does such a thing exist? And why does it exist in our commonwealth? How is it possible that our headlines continue to be filled with sexual violence cases and that we even have a PA senator that's been charged with possession of child porn? How disheartening is that? As we come to fight for things to change, we have someone who's supposed to be standing to protect people in the Commonwealth conflict doing the same thing. It's a constant reminder that we have yet to see the change that we wish to see. Those two quotes that I hold on my life is, one, a promise from God, because my faith is something that has kept me through this journey. It is for I know the plans I have for you, for plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. This reminds me that this future be beyond the pain I endured, there's a future for me. And then there's Maya's, Maya Angelou which is my favorite quote that says, there's no agony than bearing an untold story inside of you because I understand that agony too well. But by the grace of God, I've lived through it. As a young African-American woman, I excelled in school and on the track where I was one of the top cross country runners. A public league champion even went on to break national records. I decided to further my track and field career and pursue, pursue my academic aspiration as a, at a Pennsylvania State School, Cookstown University, because of the pride that I had for this great state. I wanted to remain close to home and explore college in a different setting than my center city, Philadelphia area. and also a place that my family couldn't just show up randomly on campus like most college students would like. I sought out to be a journalist and to pursue my passion for writing. I became the number two girl on the track team behind two, two seniors. I was a first generation college student, truly exuberant about the trajectory of my life and enjoying the college experience. I wasn't your typical freshman. During the first 90 days where 50% of sexual assaults happen on campus, I wasn't that group. I took summer courses prior to my freshman year. I attended tra training camp all summer long. I was extremely familiar with the campus. I already established friendships, joined committees, and I had relationships with upperclassmen. And I felt safe, as most college students should until the day I was raped by a guy on the football team. We were starting a budding friendship, talking via instant messenger and in passing, on the phone and hung out in public places from time to time. And this day I was hanging in his room, watching TV, waiting for him to finish his shift at the front desk. That was the day my whole life changed abruptly. My voice seemed to not matter, the constant no's, the clear words of I don't want to, the answer to push his hard body off of me, the tears streaming down my face, the locking of my body and the complete freeze that took place. All I could do was all I could do and none of those things signaled him to stop. The only thing I felt in that moment were the tears streaming down my face as I prayed for him to stop. I got up afraid to speak, not sure what to do next, in an actual trauma response of fawn, which is when you're being nice to that individual because you don't know what to do. I gathered myself and he said, call me, as if he just didn't happen to understand what he just did. 
I went straight back to my room in complete shock and hid and cried. I couldn't comprehend what just happened. I questioned if I was making this up. I couldn't believe it. I somehow convinced myself that it didn't happen, although deep down my body knew, but my brain just wouldn't allow it to register. I was in complete denial. An overwhelming amount of shame and guilt took over me. I pushed away the thought of the experience so far down that I thought that it would never, ever possibly resurface. I spoke to him daily on campus because I didn't want my friends to discover my secret. But then that changed. Two months later, I discovered I was pregnant. It was the first time that I ever had a conversation about rape, and it was with myself. It wasn't a conversation that my family had, that my friends had, or that my circle even talked about, or even that TV really talked much about. The idea of what I tried to bury resurfaced, and I somehow had to deal with it, and it made me nauseous. The thought of who would believe me ran through my mind, and I thought the safest choice was to never speak of it. Maybe I could just make it all disappear. But I knew that wasn't true, so I went to the person that I thought that could help. And the first person I told someone to, told it to was my 12-year-old little sister, who didn't understand what was going on at that moment. I don't think she even understood what rape was, or pregnancy for that matter. And I realized that I probably told her because I felt like that was the safest person I could tell. But then I knew I couldn't stop there. I had to tell someone else that I thought that really could help me. I was 19 years old, and I was considered an adult. But at that moment, I needed a real adult to help me navigate this space I found myself in. Who would those adults be? My family, of course. As most individuals, who do you go to first? What I learned was that those adults didn't know how to navigate this experience either and they would drive me further into silence like many people, both young and old, who disclosed to their family first. I told my father, and like any father, he went into protection mode and wanted to hurt the person who hurt me. I made him make me a promise that he wouldn't do so. The fear that my dad would go to prison for something I told and that I didn't quite understand wasn't my fault at the moment, was my reality. I then told my grandmother, whose response was, are you sure you didn't just get pregnant? Because as if teen pregnancy was more prevalent than sexual assault or rape. As a result of those responses I received from my immediate family, the idea of moving forward and telling anyone else was a death trap for me. No one ever suggested calling the police, certainly not after two months. And in my mind, logically, that made perfect sense. It was my fault anyway. What could they possibly do? Everyone was so upset and it felt like I was just causing problems for everyone because I revealed something that happened to me. That it was better left a secret. My life was completely falling apart at the seams and so were the people who I thought could help me. At this time, my mom was diagnosed with something called Guillain-Barre, which is supposed to paralyze you from the neck down. And my grandmother, that weekend, had got hit by a car and ended up needing three, re three knee replacement surgeries that forced her into retirement. I was overwhelmed with fear, shame, guilt, and that secret caused all of this is what I thought. I just wanted to disappear, therefore I went back to school pretending like nothing happened. Until I became really sick one day and got rushed to the hospital only to discover that I had an STD. So not only did he rape me, not only did he impregnate me, but now I have an STD. But through that, being at the hospital with some friends, my story was told when I didn't tell it. I came back to campus and everybody was talking about my story and his then girlfriend wanted to fight me. When my abuser found out that I was pregnant, he cornered me outside of the cafeteria to apologize. And that 
was actually a good moment. It was the first moment that I actually encountered anyone that told me or made me feel like it wasn't my fault. But I still fought this truth because it didn't make sense that it wasn't my fault. From that point, I suffered 12 long, grueling years in silence, battling severe depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide ideation, and a baby growing inside of me, constantly reminding me of yet a non, another non-consensual choice forced upon me. Failing school and not eating, school became a fading picture, and death became a more suitable answer. These experiences shattered my world and thrusted me into a full-blown nightmare that I feared I would never wake up from. My life was in shamble and suicide attempts became even more attractive. Whether it was taking pills or trying to drive off 95 Bridge as I went back and forth to work, because it was either choose go to work and take care of yourself and deal with the idea that you wanted to drive off the bridge or not go to work and not be able to take care of yourself. I became a victim of not only this experience, traumatic experience, but I was impacted by the existence of rape culture, sexism, racism, oppression, and the overarching reality of what it means to be an African-American woman and a survivor in America, which is a constant reminder that my truth doesn't matter. 35% of black women experience some form of contact of sexual violence during their lifetime. One in four black girls will be sexually abused before the age of 18. When oppression is coupled with rape culture, that continues to be, to be the susceptibility of women of color to experience sexual violence, as well as contributes to the increased barriers to service for us. And when sexual violence occurs, black women are less likely to be believed and support it. A report published in Georgetown Law Center found that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. Black girls are perceived to be more independent, more knowledgeable about sex, and less, in, less need of protection. This perception does not disappear upon adulthood but rather it follows us, causing the disturbing reality of black women and girls, adding another layer of trauma for us to overcome. It seems as if we just don't exist in this fight. To add insult to injury of my education being snatched away and all that I endured and my future seeming bleak, bleak and all of the years that I was struggling to pay, find a well-paying job, these things, these barriers to care, which is a major contributing factor to my further silence. There was no support or care until I discovered War, who offers free counseling services. It was through the intensive therapy I received that I finally found my voice and was able to officially break my silence and accept that actually what happened was not my fault. As well as now I understood the procedures that were in place and what I should do if something like this happened, which speaks to the need for prevention education in schools, but I digress. That's another conversation for another day. But when I finally was able to break my silence and I felt safe enough, secure enough, and I could truly identify what actually happened to me, I was not given the autonomy of choice for the third time by this time, but this time, it was by the system that didn't allot me the time to make the decision about what justice looked like for me and told me that my story was not valued. It was just too late. Rape is just as heinous as murder, yet there's no time limit on that. That person's story is told and justice can be rendered. So speaking of time, I would like to believe that finally remembering a childhood experience that happened to me when I was around eight, only coming to recollection around 30, suggests that I would have time or that the time would be limited on how I process that experience. Deciding if I wanna come forward or if I wanna seek justice in that case, is still limited. In anybody else in my position, it would still be limited because you have a, a limit there. So how is it possible that time is limited in any sexual assault case when I'm limited 
when I am sentenced to a lifetime of navigating this experience. It doesn't end after therapy, after a court case. I will still be faced with the reality that I was raped when I have children, when I'm intimate, when I hear the news and I turn on the TV, when a random trigger comes along that I didn't see coming, when I encounter any new experiences that involve any type of reflection of my experience. Not because I chose to, because, but because this is life after sexual violence, whether I like it or not. So time should never be a factor when I'm serving a life sentence. Now you may say, Lakeisha, I hear you, and I respect what you're saying, and changing the statutes of limitation might open up an influx of cases that the government doesn't have the capacity to handle. Well, I can't speak for every survivor, but what I do know is that at this point in my journey, I'm not sure what I would do if I was given the choice because I was not given the choice. And while that may seem alarming to many because I'm still fighting for change, I have lived with the resolve that the criminal justice didn't serve nor protect me. As many of us, we rely on God for justice because we already know that the system will fail us. So I ask you, will you allow that notion that people think that the system will continue to fail to continue to move forward? Or will you step in to do something? What I do know is that the option to not have been victimized by the system because I didn't have enough time to process and understand what happened to me, nor the support that I needed to help me through that process, that the system is designed to protect me and it would have saved me loads of tears, loads of heartache, pain, and outright re-victimization. Your daughter, your granddaughter may have that same experience as I did. And I would want her to be able to tell her story at any point in her life with the option of seeking justice. You tell me, will you give her that choice? Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you for the strength to come forward. I think it's a very important part of this conversation. Um, they're very powerful and very impactful stories, and it was important for us to have your voices as part of today's conversation. Um, I don't think any questions will do any justice for what you've shared. Just want you to know how much we appreciate and value that you have come forward and shown the strength and courage that you've done today. I don't think anyone has questions. I, I, I think we're just all very much moved by what you said. Um, we do have one final group of survivors um, who will appear as our last uh, panel and um, with Jennifer Storm. Our ninth panel today includes our victim advocate to introduce the panel, panel Jennifer Getz, who is a survivor and advocate, Taylor Ecker, who is a survivor and advocate, and Sarah Brooks, who is a survivor and advocate. So, Ms. Storm, I don't know if you'd like to. Uh, just again, I, I want to thank you so much for honoring the voices of the, divorce, the diverse stories that you're going to hear today. Um, and I'm just so incredibly proud of these amazing survivors, and it's just an honor to sit in their presence and hear their stories. So we're going to start with, uh, with Jennifer and then move on to Taylor and then Sarah. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Jennifer Getz, and this is a picture of me around age nine. 
At age eight or nine, in 1984, 85, I was sexually assaulted by a serial pedophile pediatrician named Dr. Jack Bartow. I went to the medical practice where he worked at for a follow-up visit after having strep throat. Bartow told my mother that he needed to check me in case I had a vaginal yeast infection since I had been on antibiotics. He convinced my mother to leave the room so he would not embarrass me by having to perform the exam. Back then, you didn't question people of authority. He was a doctor. My mother trusted him, so she left the room. After she left the room, he sexually assaulted me. I can still see that room to this day. The wall on one side of me, where the table was pressed up against, and him on the other side of me, trapped in the middle, staring at the door. When he was done, I left the room, and I met my mother out in the hallway. Crying, I told her, he hurt me. In 1998, three families came forward saying that their children had been sexually assaulted by Dr. Bartow. Instead of supporting these children, I watched in horror as my town, Johnstown, rallied around the good doctor. They actually passed out ribbons of support at football games. Some of his victims were forced to wear those ribbons. My town made it loud and clear back then who they believed, so I stayed quiet. In 2018, Bartow was arrested for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl during an office visit. That girl and her family had enough courage to come forward to the police and report it. I decided that I needed to come forward to talk to the police myself, knowing that probably I was too late for him to be charged with my assault, but wanting to give credibility to this girl and her family. Before that day in January 2018, only two people knew what had happened to me, my mother and my fiance. It took me 33 years to come forward. I'm now 43 years old. From the outside, I look like everybody else. I'm a healthcare professional. I've been married to the same man for 20 years. I have a beautiful daughter. From the inside though, I am damaged and have been ever since that day that I was sexually assaulted by my doctor. I had a very lonely and sad childhood. I didn't really have any friends at all. I suffered with low self-esteem. I felt dirty and ashamed of what had happened to me. I suffered with severe depression where I used to cry in the shower so no one would know what was really going through with me. I currently suffer from anxiety and panic attacks. Some mornings I wake up drenched in sweat with a full-blown panic attack because of the nightmares that I continue to have. I was in the courtroom for Bartow's sentencing. I got to listen as one by one, brave survivors were allowed to give their victim impact statements and address Bartow to his face. I was not afforded that opportunity because I was not a charged victim. He was sentenced to a maximum of 158 years in prison. While I'm glad he is in prison and unable to harm any more children, there was no justice for me and the many others like me who had timed out due to Pennsylvania's antiquated laws. This is a picture of me at age 14. The Attorney General's office had to do complicated math to figure out that I had timed out by age 15. In order for Bartow to have been charged with my sexual assault, I would have had to come forward when I was 14, still a child. Bartow admitted he sexually offended during his sexual offender assessment that he went into pediatrics so that he would have access to children. He admitted that he first started abusing his young patients when he got his medical license. I am just one of many of his survivors. Just two days before he was arrested in January 2018, he sexually assaulted three children that we know of. Three children, one day. He, was a four, he worked as a pediatrician for 44 years. I did some math. 
If we give him four weeks off every year for vacation and say he only works four days a week, he has the potential that he could have committed 25,000 sexual assaults during his lifetime as a licensed practitioner. Studies have shown that the average age a child sexual assault survivor comes forward is 52, if they ever come forward. That's past our current age given in our criminal laws and past the age given in our civil laws. These laws need to be changed. There should be no random number or age attached to this type of crime. Survivors should be able to come forward when they feel they are ready and able to do so and not have justice denied to them due to a random number or age that was picked and put into law. Barto, like so many others, including Sandusky and Nasser, used their power of authority and reputation in the community to keep victims silent. Who's going to believe the word of a child against the good doctor or the good football coach? In my case, Barto was the good doctor who sang in his church choir, volunteered to coach sports teams, and was a member of the school board. My town bought that image and portrayed that he portrayed and dismissed his victims as nobodies. There needs to be a retroactive window to allow survivors the opportunity for civil justice. As survivors, we were silenced by our communities who would not believe us even if we came forward. Opening a window does not guarantee that a predator or institution will be held liable. There still is a burden of proof that has to be met. You've heard some today say that it's unconstitutional to open a window. Others today have said that it is constitutional. As legislators, your job is to pass laws, period. Let the courts decide if it's unconstitutional. You've heard some today say that there is no need for a window, there is a compensation fund. Catholic clergy survivors make up about 4% of all Pennsylvania child sexual assault survivors. That means for the 96% of us who were sexually assaulted by teachers, doctors, coaches, family, friends, neighbors, we don't even have that as an option. You've heard some say today that only the predator should be held accountable for their crime and not the institutions to which they belong. Institutions need to be held accountable as well. Just like in the Sandusky case or the Nasser case, people at those institutions knew what was going on and they chose to do nothing about it. In my case, numerous families had complained throughout the decades, coming forward and telling the doctor's practice what he had done to their children. They chose to do nothing to stop him, in essence, gifting him victims every day they allowed him to work there. A great friend of mine and a fellow survivor once described our lives as survivors as being a thousand piece puzzle. We're working so hard to put the puzzle pieces together only to discover that one piece is missing, justice. You as legislators have the power to give us that missing piece so that we can complete our puzzle. I urge you to pass the new statute of limitations and open a window for all survivors. Other states have done so, so can you. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually assaulted by the time they are 18. That means somewhere in your circle of family, friends, neighbors, even the people you walk past in these halls, you've encountered a survivor of child sexual assault. It takes courage to come here as a survivor and talk to you today. And it will take courage on your part to stand up and do the right thing and pass these laws and a window in the face of resistance from the leadership putting pressure on you not to do so. Please have that courage and do what is right. Thank you. Normalizing predatory behaviors has transpired since the dawn of human existence. 
from covering up billionaires' heinous acts against children to doctors who abuse their powers because they are perceived as righteous healers or politicians who are begged to resign because fellow associates believe it is better for the community to have this individual removed rather than continue on their political path. This is the world we live in, where it's easier for everyone to be silent and submissive due to wanting a perceived polished reputation or career. My name is Taylor Ecker, and I am a survivor of childhood and adult sexual abuse. From the dawn of my existence, I have been more comfortable with discomfort than with praise and appreciation. Starting at the age of five, I was being sexually abused by my half-brother. It was a game, the brother-sister game. He started with, this is what every brother and sister does, and proceeded to slide his tongue down my throat. It quickly went from that to him making me do things to him and him make, doing things to me. This went on for four years. Every time we were alone, he would take me behind the big couch or under the coffee table in the living room and we would play our game. I remember the first and last time he abused me vividly. I almost see it now as an outer body experience. I see a little girl just wanting to make her big brother happy. I just wanted him to play with me. The last time we played, we were under the coffee table. He was lying on top of me and told me we couldn't play the game anymore. He got up and walked away. This little nine-year-old girl was left alone under that coffee table crying because her brother didn't want to play with her anymore. That's still a thought that breaks me. My brother groomed me so well that when he stopped molesting me, I was heartbroken about it. Just like any heartbreak or disappointment, we move on and tend to leave those old, tattered memories to the back of our minds. In 11th grade health class, my teacher read the definition of molestation out loud. Molestation, noun. The crime of sexual acts with children up to the age of 18, including touching of private parts, exposure of genitalia, taking pornographic pictures, rape, inducement of sexual acts with molester, or with children, and variations of these acts by pedophiles. Molestation also applies to incest by a relative with a minor family member and any unwanted sexual acts with adults short of rape. In that moment, I realized what had happened to me. Half listening because I was probably self-medicated, a tidal wave of memories came flooding back into my mind. In that full classroom, I felt like I was on a secluded island. By that time in my life, I had already lost my virginity due to rape in the 10th grade, was molested by an older guy at my own party, and was physically abusing my body by cutting or using drugs and eating my way into obesity. I was already lost, and now I saw why. Once I received clarity on what had happened to me, I told my mom. She told me my brother had done this to other members of my family. My only request was for her not to tell my dad because I wanted to talk to him myself. She went against my wishes and told him anyway, so soon after I received a call from him asking if it was true. He said if it did happen, I would have told him in the moment. That was the conversation, really the only conversation I had with him. He made it clear it didn't need to be brought up, that it was in the past, and he didn't want to be the father of a victim or a predator. After that, I started to spiral and attempted to take my own life. I was 16. It is because of my own resiliency that I am even here today. I started to value my life again. I got an internship or two, went to college, started my own business, lost over 100 pounds, and it still didn't stop someone from drugging and raping me only four years ago. You see, when we talk about sexual assault or the statue of limitations, we are talking about something much deeper. It's something that is engraved into our society. It is a fear and a lack of true understanding, empathy. How do we fix it? How do we even talk about it? It's not years of protesting or marches. It's certainly not by being keyboard warriors on Facebook or Twitter. It's by action, true action. <laughs> Your action by each of you sitting here. A percentage of people believed in you so much that they voted for you to sit in these very seats. They asked you to take responsibility and to make positive change for them, for us, for me, 
by denying my right to heal on my terms, on my timeline. You are denying me of my civil, civil liberties and my pursuit to happiness. Why do you wish to slow down or spoil someone's joy? We humans have a lot to learn, but we can start by fighting our own personal biases or preconceived notions. You can start by passing comprehensive reforms for time-barred survivors. By finally voting through survivor-based bills, you will start a wave of understanding. It starts here by you. Institutions and evil individuals have had their way for far too long. You will not only change the lives of present and future survivors, but you will change the conversation as a whole. There will be a freedom for victims that I can't even comprehend. This will impact society by ending submissive behaviors in favor of rape culture. This will be the beginning to the end, the end of oppressing those who have had everything taken away from them. When you sexually assault someone, you murder without killing them. You leave them here to feel that pain forever. All we have are the broken pieces of our hearts and the sheer understanding that this system that says it will protect and defend us is protecting our predators exponentially more. My lack of understanding in a timely manner has to have me chained to my past and my predators physically free. Do it for the children. Do it for your children. Do it to save your job or fall asleep at night. At this point, I could care less what your motives are. Just protect your people. Don't slow down someone's healing or spoil someone's joy. Look beyond your own comprehension and understand we may not know what happens to us two or 52 years from now. Nonetheless, the absence of knowledge, awareness, or realization is not the victim's indiscretion. It is your civic duty to stand guard and assure the people that you will cushion their fall and care for them when they cannot care for themselves. By giving victims another path to healing, you are building a better humanity. Administering to the rehabilitation of a damaged and mutilated nation is what will make this civilization strong again. And by strong, I mean mentally free from the shackles of our past, the prisons of our fractured minds. I shouldn't have to be here, yet you all squander towards survivors for light and hope. Your empty words mean nothing. People are suffering and people are dying. The science has been around for far too long and it is necessary to dispel myths about sexual assault that continue to be prevalent even in today's society. Myths like victims are usually raped by strangers, victims never communicate with their attacker, or they promptly report an assault to the authorities. Dr. Ziv, who testified on the Cosby case, said it best. We blame victims for not being the kind of victim we think they should be. It's part of the rape myth that victims report promptly and display a certain set of symptoms. She goes on to say, if your interpretation is that this person with whom I had what I thought was a good relationship, who respected me, who I respected, we had fun together, whatever it is, sexually assaults me, if I accept that, that means I have to accept that I have no worth to that person. That's a very tough pill for anybody to swallow. In the time it has taken me to read my deepest thoughts and concerns, roughly six people have been sexually assaulted. They say one in four or five or six people will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime, but in my family, my mom, sister, and I have all been sexually assaulted on more than one occasion. This goes much further than any statistic can ever attempt to fathom. This is an epidemic and you are the people to forever fix this flawed narrative. I have deep gratitude for those of you who are sitting here and listening to hear not to reply or discredit. To the survivors in this room who are sitting here, I believe you, I am here for you, and you are certainly strong enough. Remember, reporting an abuser doesn't ruin their life. They did that themselves. Remember, reporting an abuser doesn't damage their reputation. It makes it more accurate. Senate, 
You are capable of great things. Now go do them. I think I'm here today to represent um, an ongoing group of people who are coming forward. Um, we know that this epidemic occurs not only in healthcare sy systems, but in the Catholic Church. I am none of those. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. So my story begins um, at the age of 14 when I was sexually abused by two individuals within the congregation. One was a, simply a brother or a family friend of our congregation, and the other was my former sister-in-law. And they abused me individually, simultaneously, and repeatedly for many years. I beat a lot of the statistics as far as coming forward in my age and as far as prosecuting goes because I have done both of those. So I sit in this courtroom today My heart goes out to people like this who have not been able to experience what it is like to sit on the other side. I had my day in court and I was able to give my victim impact statement. And I went into that courtroom that day, weighted down with so much pain and guilt and I came from a past that was certainly ugly. But I came from a past where people did not believe me. And that went as far back as my family to the York County Police Department initially. I reported numerous times throughout my life. And so by putting a date or an age on when I should have recovered, it's really remarkable that I have gotten as far as I have because I was shot down so many times. When I came forward again at 26, I realized I only had a few more years. <clears throat> and so I hurried up and healed, if that makes any sense. I almost lost my job, I was a terrible mother, and I was um, addicted to numerous things. But those years of turmoil paid off for me because after my victim impact statement, I told the court that day exactly what that man and woman had done to me. And it was liberating. I gave them vivid details that I still remember because those details don't go away. It's not like, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? It was, which side was he on when he pinned you in the truck under his seatbelt? Did he hold your mouth? Which fist was it that went into you? These are the types of details that do not leave. And so I ask you to please consider the fact that they don't go away, even though I've had my day in court, but I feel considerably stronger and healthier as an individual for being able to have that day. And even though my abusers did not, they did not suffer the consequences that I was promised or that I had hoped for but I had my day. And my being able to speak in front of that courtroom and in front of the judge and in front of my abuser's family and friends means more to me than any dollar amount that you could possibly put on that. It is not about the money, it never is. And the Jehovah's Witness organization that I turned to to help then and continually throughout the years, continued to cover it up. It is not a Catholic church problem. It is not a healthcare problem or a school system problem. This is a society problem, our society's problem. And we and you all need to take it into consideration and change it because it is not fair to us victims. It is fair to the pedophilers and into the institutions who are helping to cover it up. So I implore you to please do not turn a blind eye to this. Please do not just sit here and pretend to do a job. Do it. Please, please stand up for what is right because there is no middle ground. There is not. You either stand to protect children or you stand for pedophiles. So where do you stand? Senator Pittman? Senator, where do you stand? 
I implore you, do not look, do not turn away from this and please face it head on like the rest of us are doing and pass this statute of limitations reform. It is needed, other states are doing it. I appreciate your time. Thank you all for, for being here and what I will say to you is we believe you. Um, and in the face of all that you've dealt with, you also do something very powerful, and that is to demonstrate who you are and that you do offer hope to others because of who you are and how you've come forward today. Um, I can't promise what this committee will do, but I can promise you that you have made an impact and um, this conversation is extremely valuable for our deliberations. I, I, I thank you all for being here and um, say yeah, we believe you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for, for coming forward today and thank the first panel as well. Um, you know, when we began this morning, I had talked uh, my comments about <clears throat> what we have heard over the last couple of years, people coming forward, uh, and the fact that we've yet to take action. And uh, I'm sorry that we haven't. We have to. I don't know what else can be said. Um, what we've heard today, what have everyone has heard today? Excuse me. You know, moving is. May I ask where the rest of the senators went? I mean, here we are at the end, hearing from the abusers, or hearing from the the victims of these abuse, and we are listening to half of the, the panel. I, I, I understand when you look here, you, you, you believe that it's just the people here. Um, and I should have said this at the outset of the hearing, many members have um, requirements that take them in and out of the meeting. This is being recorded, their staff members, and they, will go back and review the entire totality of what's here. They will also review the input that we will continue to receive after today because I truly believe what you've said will spark other people to want to share and bring forward their thoughts. So that will all be part of what we look at as the totality of, of today. So I wouldn't look at it that they're not interested. I wouldn't look at it that they're not here. It's that they had a, another obligation, unfortunately. And you are not last because you're least important. You're last because um, you're the last word. I just wanted to clarify. I was curious. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Madam Chair. And, and thank you. And I to, know. Just, I just wanted to just again thank you. Uh, just to wrap. Thank you again. Um, People in this building know, they know, and they know they have to act. And again, we believe you, We've always believed you. And I'll say it again, I am sorry that you have to come in here again and do this. I, I saw the reading of the testimony time and time again. It has to stop. You know, I, I come from a, um, Family, as so many as so many folks today said, you know, brought up Catholic. My mom goes to church every single Sunday, and she has even said, "Enough. This is enough. We do. We need to act." And again, I am I am sorry that you have to do this, and I can't even begin to understand. It's impossible for me to ever understand what it is like, and that's why I can only say I'm sorry. 
I hope that there's someone who can make sure. Um, we have um, five to seven crisis counselors here. Okay. And so yes, absolutely. They're, my staff I, are have been kind of fawned out all day long, um, providing I, assistance. I, I mean, the whole. We don't want to see someone. Yes. Have. Um, absolutely. So I, I know that um, Jennifer Storm, the advocate, was going to just offer some brief kind of closing comments on behalf of the, the victims. You did also receive significant input from close to 40, maybe even more than that, victims who were in touch with you. So if you want to just take a couple minutes to share that, that would be. Sure. I will try to cut my testimony in half. It was going to be roughly eight minutes. Um, but what I will do is try to just get to the bulk of what is more, most important, which is the voice of the survivors. Um, so obviously, I'm Jennifer Storm. I'm the victim advocate for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, I want to thank you again for We move the table card. They'll have you as oh. Taylor Edgar. Oh. And I, I, I would be honored to be Taylor, as passionate and powerful as that woman is. is terrific. But today, I am definitely Jennifer Storm. Thank you. <laughs> um, obviously, as one can imagine, when this hearing was announced, there were scores of victims and survivors uh, who began to call Senator Baker's office, requesting the ability to testify before the Judiciary Committee. For so many victims and survivors, this has been a day that has been longed for and requested for years. No other hearing in this issue has ever been held where the voice of the survivors was not only allowed, but encouraged. I met with Senator and her staff to develop a plan to meet the needs of, many, as, with, to meet the needs of as many survivors as possible. And I want to acknowledge right now the degree of care and concern that went into making sure survivors' voices were heard here today. Um, I certainly very much appreciate it, and the survivors with whom stories I'm going to give to you today very much appreciate it. As indicated earlier, my office quickly developed a web page where we could accept victim testimony either anonymously or with an individual's name. We asked for the impact of their crime. We asked for their recommendations. Those of us in victim services recognize that a fundamental part of a victim's healing is being heard. Not every victim or survivor is able to be here today. Not all of them are emotionally able to speak out in a public forum. For some, the pain is far too great, and the emotional and physical toll of their trauma does not afford them this ability. For others, there are still concerns of safety and retaliation if they speak out and identify themselves. In taking into consideration all these variations, we attempted to gather as many perspectives and their recommendations for you today. Obviously, we have in no way been able to hear from everyone who has been impacted in Pennsylvania by these horrific crimes. And up until this morning, we have now heard from over 50 survivors who have asked us to portray their thoughts and recommendations to you. Here's a sampling of what we heard, and these are direct quotes. It was dark, so heavy. It hurt just to be alive. It's like waking up from a coma. It seems like there are more rights for the people that, are, that assault. I feel that because I am in law enforcement, I should be stronger for others. My, dro my brother Joey is not able to be here with you today, but he's here in spirit. Please be his voice. This man stole my innocence, my childhood. I remember being afraid to fall asleep because he may come into my room and rape me. When I was around men at age five until the, my 40s, I was afraid of men touching me because I was thinking that they might have thoughts of raping me too. All the excitement and happiness that I first felt when I met him in seventh grade turned into shame and fear. My music teacher used every tactic in his arsenal to keep me quiet. This abuse has taken an enormous emotional toll. At times it feels as though I have been through a war. My trust has been shattered and it has taken years of therapy to rebuild that and to restore my faith in the people, and I still struggle. I suffer from anxiety and depression. I, st I trust nobody. I was coerced into taking a settlement by Bishop Gaynor with the promise of additional money. Those monies have not come. I am now suing the Harrisburg Diocese. I carried and still carry so much guilt for not telling sooner. I am angry. I didn't go to the police when I became an adult, but I wasn't ready to come forward. I have not been able to have a healthy relationship. 
I have tried to commit suicide. The rejection from family members has been very emotionally draining on me. I never married or had children. I don't like being touched, even prefer not shaking hands with people. I'm almost 57 and I feel like the trauma happened today. I've struggled with drug and alcohol abuse and a fear of being profiled as gay. I'm afraid that I will harm my own children and I have trouble leaving my home because I will run into my offender. I failed out of college after being raped my freshman year. My daughter lived in fear and experienced paranoia before she died. I have had to relocate to a different city and change most aspects of my daily routine. On behalf of those of us who have lost our children as a result of this horrific crime, not only does the abuse affect the individual, but has far-reaching tentacles that affect the entire family for generations to come. After freeing myself from that teacher, I moved frequently and told no one where I was. I have anxiety every day. I'm scared of being abandoned, scared of facing him all the time. I was victimized by a magnanimous wolf in sheep's clothing. All this time and over all these years, I thought I was the only victim and was too afraid to tell my parents or siblings. I want to acknowledge the strength and courage and bravery that it took these survivors in these cases to come forward and express these sentiments to you. I also want to pause for a moment and ask that you see the many faces of the survivors that are here today, many of whom stories I just read to you. Many of these strong and amazing people have been here for more than a decade asking for change, reform, and help. Some of these victims were under 18, under the age of 18 at the time of their crimes, and some were older. But you would never know the difference. You would not be able to tell from the quotes that I spoke who were the children and who were the adults. Because their trauma is so similar regardless of the age of which they were violated. What many of us are failing to comprehend is how we can consider creating a bifurcated process. One that allows a 16-year-old rape victim more time to process their trauma than a 19-year-old, especially considering the risk of college campuses. Who are we as a commonwealth to predetermine who should have a faster healing process than another? Who are we to weigh this trauma? Where's the science? Where's the data? The evidence to base such a claim. To craft a law based on assumptions that because you turn 18, your biological and neurological responses to trauma will be different is scientifically inaccurate, furthers the ongoing harm of these crimes and confuses everyone. Over the last several years, our health and medical fields have taken into account the reality of neurobiology and we have modified laws that apply to our juvenile and criminal justice systems as a result. Much of that great work has been done by this body. We now allow for expert testimony in all sexual assault cases in order to explain what is often misunderstood and used against victims to blame, shame, and dismiss them. We recognize that brain development continues well into the 20s and no 18-year-old is magically neurologically fully developed. They are still learning and growing. We also know that scientifically trauma interrupts the brain's development. The impact of sexual violence is a traumatic and life-altering act regardless of the age in which it's perpetrated. If we set time limits that are different for one group of survivors and against another, we better have really strong scientific data to support that decision. Every 73 seconds an American is sexually assaulted. Every nine minutes that victim is a child. Meanwhile, only five of every 1,000 perpetrators go to jail. This is due in large part by our antiquated statutes of limitations and not for the lack of people wanting justice. In the time that it took for this testimony, you heard already roughly 245 Americans will have experienced sexual assault. We need to ensure that we are structuring our justice system to provide trauma-informed responses to all survivors of sexual violence, regardless of the age at which their crimes happened. We must put a focus on holding the offenders accountable and crafting our laws in a way that say we value innocence, joy, and a life free from the horror of sexual violence. The only way to do this is by removing every conceivable barrier to justice for survivors and removing every shadow that our, lives, our laws provide for perpetrators to hide in silence. On behalf of the over 50 victims, they asked me to tell you that every single one of them is asking you to abolish the statute of limitations for adult and child sexual assaults. Furthermore, the vast majority of those same survivors are currently asking for the greater protection of the citizenry by the opening of a two-year window to ensure any and all past offenders are exposed and taken out of their respective roles to further rape, abuse, and harm. Thank you. Thank you for um, being the last voice for today, and I know that you will likely 
receive additional testimony. Obviously, between the hearing testimony, the submissions, the added submissions that we received, um, and what I expect will be a lot more material, we will continue to be reviewing that and reflecting and looking um, as a committee at how we move forward. So with that, um, I don't know if you have any final comments. That will conclude today's hearing and we will recess to the call of the chair. I wanna thank everyone for your um, incredible patience and civility and respect through this whole proceeding. It was greatly, greatly appreciated. With that, thank you. We will recess to the call of the chair.